Thank you for registering for the Docker for Java Developers course. As a part of this course, I'm going to walk you through Docker fundamentals, an introduction to Docker, the building blocks of Docker, a real-world use case which Docker tries to solve. After that, you will learn how to install Docker on Mac and Windows 10 Professional. To start with, since this is a use case based approach, I'm going to show you how to host a website inside a Docker container running Apache HTTPD. Use case 2 is going to run through hosting a website on Nginx HTTP server. As a part of these two sections, I'm also going to show you some of the building blocks of Docker and how to use Docker to build, list and inspect images, run containers, start and stop containers, logging the outputs of the container, removing containers and images, and also to push and pull images from the Docker Hub. As a part of use case 3, you will learn how to integrate Docker with Git and deploy your own custom Ubuntu image. As Java developers, everybody works with an MVC. So you'll learn how to deploy a Spring MVC war application on Apache Tomcat. You'll also learn how to deploy multiple containers with different JDK and Tomcat versions on Ubuntu. The different strategies to mount volumes. Last but not the least, how to use Docker Machine and Docker Compose for microservices. We will go through a hands-on lecture with Docker Spring Boot and Hibernate with MySQL running on Docker containers. Last but not the least, you'll learn how to do service discovery and load balancing. All the lectures and cheat sheets are available for your download after the end of the course. I hope you enjoy this course. Look forward to seeing you in the course. Welcome to the lecture on quick introduction to Docker. As a part of the Docker introduction and fundamentals, we are going to go over some of the important concepts of Docker, the different components used in Docker, and some of the real-world problems that Docker attempts to solve. As a part of this course, you will look at Docker components and Docker concepts. As far as Docker components, you will be going over Docker Engine, Docker Hub, Docker Machine, and Docker Compose. Docker Swarm is not covered as this is an introductory level course. Kitematic is also not covered as it's still in beta. As far as concepts, we will see how to create Docker containers, how to work with Docker images, how to mount Docker volumes, how to commit Docker images to a repository, how to tag them in a repository, how to push them to a repository or pull them from a repository, and some of the command line tools used in Docker. Now, let's take a look at what is Docker and how it differs from the other virtualization technologies available. Docker is a platform for developing, shipping, and running applications using a container-based virtualization technique. On this slide, let's take a look at that picture. The picture depicts the difference between Docker and a virtual machine. As you can see, the left-hand side runs the virtual machine such as hypervisor and the right hand side runs the docker engine. Both of them sit on top of the host operating system which is the operating system on the server. The hypervisor on the other hand has a guest operating system and the guest operating system has all the softwares and the applications which are installed. On the other hand the docker engine does not have a guest operating system. So let's take a look at the differences apart from the guest operating system in terms of the containers versus the virtual machines. Docker runs the same operating system as the host operating system. Now there are some benefits to this. This allows us to share all the resources of the host operating system. In order to achieve this, the team at Docker originally used Linux containers, also called LXC, but later on they moved to Run C, also called as lib containers. 
Docker also features a layered file system called the AUFS. So it not just only has a read part, but also has a write part and can be merged together as far as its relationship with the host operating system. One could have common parts of the operating system as read only and then give each container its own mount for writing. Virtual machines, on the other hand, get its own set of resources allocated to it and do minimal sharing with the host operating system. Of course, there's advantages of using the virtual machine as well. Virtual machine, for example, is more isolated, but it can be very heavy on the resources. Docker gives you less isolation, but the containers are lightweight. From a Java development perspective, Docker suits the need the best. If you need to know more differences between virtual machines and Docker, I highly recommend Google search on how is Docker different from a normal virtual machine and you will see a Stack Overflow page pop up. That page actually has all information you would need to understand all the differences in detail between a normal virtual machine and Docker. Since this is an introductory level course and more specific to Java developers, I'm going to cover something specific to Java. Thank you. In order to explain the concept of a Docker engine, I'm going to give you an analogy between the car engine and the Docker engine. Just like a car needs an engine to run, Docker also needs an engine to run. Docker engine sits on top of the host operating system. In short, Docker engine is a lightweight container runtime. Let's go through what it means. If you take a look at this picture, we have infrastructure or server on the bottom, a host operating system which sits on top of the server, and Docker engine which sits on top of the host operating system. The Docker engine allows you to run multiple containers. In this case, the Docker engine allowed you to run multiple versions of JDK and Tomcat on the same machine. As you go through the lectures, you will have a better understanding of what a Docker engine is. I was just hoping to give you a sneak peek of the Docker engine. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Now let us take a look at a real world use case. Let's say we have two teams, team A and team B. As of today, the teams share the same infrastructure. In the past, they had requirements which allowed them to use the same versions of the JDK and Tomcat. So they were able to expose different ports and get their applications running in production using the same infrastructure. So they never had any issues. Now the problem. Team A has engineers who want to develop on Mac OS X. However, their application in production is going to run on Ubuntu 16.01 with JDK 1.7 and Tomcat 7. And QA doesn't like the idea of shipping software developed on Mac OS X and QA on Ubuntu. Team B, on the other hand, wants to upgrade JDK to 1.8 and Tomcat 8 and wants to run CentOS in production to run their app. Now, the summary of the problem. Developing on different operating systems and having QA tested can be a challenge. How can we have the same hardware version support two versions of JDK, the 1.7 and the 1.8? Also, from a managerial perspective, a server costs several thousand dollars. Everyone wants optimal usage of the servers. The problem continues. DevOps is worried about frequent change in JDK versions and software requirements for both the teams. Operationalizing both the applications in the same infrastructure is a huge challenge. And making sure QA team gets the application with the same setup where it was developed is indeed a nightmare. Developers, on the other hand, along with QA, are worried about different things. Developers are worried about how they would develop in different operating systems, integrating the changes. Now, assume that the development team is spread across the world where front-end engineers are in California, server-side engineers are in New York, 
and they're all working on different operating systems. They indeed have a challenge to integrate all their code and have QA tested. QA is concerned about whether it is a valid option to even test the software and, it's and if it's worth their time. This is because the software is being developed on a different hardware and an operating system and then the test environment which goes into QA and UAT and production is completely different. So both the teams get to the manager to get a new hardware as a means to solve the issue. The management declines the proposal stating no budget for new hardware, use of existing hardware and optimizing it, but still guaranteeing that the applications developed can work independently on the same software and can be developed on the same platforms and tested. So how do we solve all of this? Let's take a look at how Docker tries to resolve this issue in the next lecture. Thank you for watching. When the team struggle to find a solution, one of the members of one of the teams has an excellent idea. And the idea is to use Docker. Now the picture on the screen is probably very familiar to you. You probably saw it in the previous lectures. As you can see, the infrastructure or the server sits on the bottom. On top of the infrastructure is installed the host operating system. Now it could be Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, etc, etc. And on top of this, it sits the Docker engine. And the Docker engine is responsible for spawning container 1 and container 2. As you can see, container 1 is nothing but JDK 1.7 with Tomcat 7 and container 2 runs JDK 1.8 with Tomcat 8. So all this Docker engine is doing is to spawn multiple containers. Now remember, these containers have their own processing ability, own memory and own volumes mounted to the host operating system and they can interact with the host operating system or, on the, or with the files on the host operating system. Just to summarize, Docker engine, as you saw on the previous slide, allows you to run different containers. Now imagine containers as good as a new virtual PC with its own memory, processing ability and volumes. Isn't that cool? Now, pretend as if you're running a PC inside another PC. Now we call the PC which is running the container as the host and the PC which is running, which is run by the Docker engine as the container. The difference between the host and container is very important for you to understand before you get through the samples. So I highly recommend going through the, this slide and the one before to get an understanding of what is a container versus what is the host machine. Now let's take a look at how the problem got resolved. So as you can see in the picture, the Docker engine sits on top of the host machine, or in fact inside the host machine, and is responsible for spawning container one and container two. Container one runs Tomcat 7 with JDK 1.7. Container two runs Tomcat 8 with JDK 1.8. As you can see, both of them run, run on port 8080. Now remember, you might be wondering how port 8080 is shared between these two containers. Remember, these two are virtual machines, which means they're as good as a PC running inside a PC, just that it's virtual. And they have their own ports, they have their own memory. They can mount their own volumes to the operating system and they can share volumes too. So long story short, how do requests work? As you can see on, on top of the arrow, the Docker engine allows you to specify port mappings. For example, requests sent to port 5555 as an example, will be forwarded to container 1 and the request sent to port 6666 will be forwarded to container 2. Now what I mean by that is 5555 and 6666 are arbitrary numbers. They could just be anything. So anything coming into 5555 will go into container 1, 6666 will go into container 2. So this way we solve the problem. So let's look at how we solve the problem for each of the team members. Team A, developers who work on different apps uh, by developing them on Mac OS X using JDK 1.7 and Tomcat 7 can be worry free because when they're using Docker, it's going to be consistent across all the environments. Team B gets to use JDK 1.8 and Tomcat 8 even though they share the servers with Team A. QA, on the other hand, is happy as they get to test an application developed using the same OS. So what they test is what it was developed on. DevOps, on the other hand, gets to run the apps of both the teams on the same infrastructure with different memory requirements and different JVMs. 
Management is happy because there is less expense, less effort and faster deployment. Now, remember, you probably heard of Maven for Java. All Maven does is to download all the latest and greatest version of the jar files and the dependencies. So Docker for DevOps is like Maven for Java. It allows for update of packages and easy installation of softwares and all the dependencies. We will walk through it as we go on. So a quick summary, Docker is simple and easily configurable. It's easy to develop on, has faster release cycles, faster deployment times, reduced bloat as compared to other virtualization techniques and consistent development of software across all environments. We're going to take a look at how all of this is achieved with the samples. Stay tuned. Let's take a look at Docker installation instructions on the Mac. The installation procedure will be done in steps. First, you will download the code samples for exercises. Then you will install Visual Studio Code and with the Docker plugin on Visual Studio Code. And the third one covers installing Docker. Now let's get started. Now let us take a look at Docker installation on the Mac. The first thing we are going to do is to install the code samples. The code samples will help you progress through the upcoming lectures. Go to www.github.com forward slash pick to learn. Navigate to the Docker tutorial project and download the zip file. Now let's see how we can do that. In order to download the code samples, go to github.com forward slash pick to learn. Go to the Docker tutorial section, click on the clone or download link and download the zip file. Go ahead uncompress zip file. After you uncompress it, move to a location of your choice. Now let's see how we can install Visual Studio Go Code. Google on Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is a project written to work on all operating systems by Microsoft and it's basically an editor. And it can be used with the Docker plugin to work on Docker projects. Now let's take a look at how to download Visual Studio Code. Google for Visual Studio Code. You should be able to download the one for your operating system from here. If you uh, don't find it out here, you can click on the top right hand corner where it says download. Download it for the Mac. Unzip the file. Double click on it and it will say open. You should be able to see an editor like this. Search for Docker. If it's not installed, you will see an icon to say install it. I apparently already installed it once. So um, it would usually ask you to install it and restart. So after you're done restarting it, click on open folder, go to desktop, go to the application sample and click open. And you should see all of the use cases in here. We're going to work with these samples. Now let's take a look at how we can install Docker. To install Docker, go to docker.com and download the community edition for your respective operating system. Let's take a look at how to download Docker. Go into docker.com. Click on get Docker community edition. You can also get Docker from from here. Go to get Docker C from Docker Store. And you should see one for Mac OS X. Get Docker. Save file. I probably already have Docker. But nevertheless, once Docker is downloaded, double click on the DMG file, drag it to the applications folder, go to the applications folder, 
look for docker double click on it say open and you should see that there is an icon coming up here this is nothing but the docker daemon it's starting up right now so without the docker daemon docker will not work so docker is running right now so i recommend opening up a terminal just do docker version it should tell you the version of the client and the server it is using it is experimental because it's community edition as it says it's dash ce this is the server this is the client i'll go over the difference between the docker client the docker server and the docker daemon i also want to show you the um, the usage of how to use the docker daemon so as you can see there are multiple options here kitematic is one of the options which we are not going to cover um, check for updates docker store preferences i have unchecked start docker when you log in just because of performance reasons file sharing i will go over it as and when we go through the lectures advanced talks to you about the virtual machine which is in use when you install docker typically it's called boot to docker this tells you that docker is using four cpus with two gigs of ram depending on your development requirements this can be changed proxies i'm just going to leave it as u system proxy daemon as you can see it's got a basic and advanced section um, you can configure the docker.com file but from a perspective of advanced usage we're not going to talk about it in this lecture series reset if you want to make changes to uh, already existing changes and get it back to the factory version i would just click on reset and then you can uninstall it or reset to factory defaults i highly recommend using the uninstall method from here so that it removes all of your settings uh, correctly all right then so that's uh, docker installation for you now let's get started with our first act of playing with docker sounds exciting doesn't it okay let's get started open up a terminal and execute the following command i'm going to show you in the upcoming video as well but this is just a powerpoint for reference in case you want to download it this will help you understand the interaction of docker client which you're running on the terminal now let's check it out we're going to do one more test to make sure docker has been installed correctly so what i would do is just like we have the hello world application in all programming languages we will do docker run hyphen it hello hyphen world it is pulling up down the Im information from the docker image um, in the repository so it says unable to find image locally which means it was unable to find an image locally uh, you will have a better understanding of this when we go through the lectures in this case it's pulling the hello world image from the docker hub or the repository as you can see pull is complete it says hello from docker so i highly recommend reading this um, this is going to give you an idea of the docker client and the docker daemon it says the docker client connected contacted the docker daemon the docker daemon pulled the hello world image from docker hub the docker daemon created a new container from that image which runs the executable that produces the output you're currently reading the docker daemon streamed that output to the docker client which sent it to your terminal so i highly recommend reading through these steps a few times this is very important to understand the life cycle of how docker works this will give you a clear synopsis of the difference between the docker client and the docker daemon uh, it also clarifies what a docker hub is uh, as you know docker hub is a repository of all the images um, so it's like maven having all the repos of the jar files so just like that we have a repo for hello world and that's what it's uh, that's what is being done by the docker client so when we run docker version we are inherently running the docker client and we are calling the docker daemon and the docker daemon gives you back the information Now let's get started with installation of Docker on Windows 10. Please note that Docker has in updated their Docker toolset. So I highly recommend using Windows 10 professional or enterprise as a part of this lecture. 
As a part of the procedure, we are going to download the code samples for the exercises, install Visual Studio Code with the Docker plugin, and then install Docker. So let's get started. We're going to look at how we can install the code samples on Windows. Go to github.com forward slash pick to learn, navigate to the Docker tutorial project and download the zip file with the source code. Now let's see how we can do that. Now let's take a look at how we can download the code samples. Go to github.com forward slash pick to learn. You will find the Docker tutorial project. Click on it. Click on clone or download. Download the zip file. Unzip it. I'm just going to move it to the desktop. Now let's take a look at installation instructions for Visual Studio Code on Windows 10. Google on Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is a project written to work on all operating systems by Microsoft. It's basically an editor and it can be used with the Docker plugin to work on Docker projects. So let's see how we can do that. Now let's take a look at how we can install Visual Studio Code. Google on Visual Studio Code. Go to code.visualstudiocode.com. You should find the download um, for your operating system here. If you cannot find it, you might want to click on the download button on the top right hand corner. And then you can click on the link which is related to your operating system. I'm just going to install it. I'm just going to move it to a drive of my choice. Just click on launch Visual Studio Code. Once you launch Visual Studio Code, you will have an option to install the Docker plugin. Click on the link on the bottom, which says extensions. Um, Docker apparently is already installed. If it has a, an update, it's gonna show you. If you don't have Docker plugin installed, it's gonna come up with an install icon. So let me just update it. It's saying reload, so I'm just gonna reload it. And there you go you have Visual Studio Code with the Docker plugin installed. So what I would do is I would open a folder, and in this case, I would go to the desktop and open the Docker Tutorial Master. And then you'll have all the examples for this course here. So definitely uh, take a look at it, and that's about it as far as installation of Visual Studio Code. Now let's take a look at Docker installation on Windows 10. As I had earlier stated that Windows 10 professional or enterprise at this juncture are the best operating systems to install Docker and work with the examples because Docker toolbox, which was supported prior is no longer being supported by Docker. So go to docker.com, download the community edition for your operating system. Now let's see how we can do that. Now to make sure you can install Docker correctly, you will need hypervisor enabled in Windows. So in order to do that, you can Google on um, Windows hypervisor enable, click on either the first link which says install Hyper-V on Windows. I usually go in for the one which has the blog. So if you go back to the BIOS, make sure that virtualization technology is enabled. If your computer supports Windows 10, it is highly likely that virtualization technology is inbuilt toward the BIOS. I highly recommend and make sure to make sure that this particular feature is enabled. The second thing you want to do is to Google or um, not Google, uh, basically go to Windows, look for turn Windows features on or off. If you click on this link here, and this is all documented on this website, you will see that Hyper-V should be enabled. 
If this is not enabled, Docker will ask you to enable it. So even if you have it disabled here, Docker is going to install uh, fine, but then it's going to ask you if you want to enable Hyper-V at the end of the installation. It'll just restart your system and everything is going to be back to normal. So just keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at how we can install Docker. Go to docker.com and you should see a get Docker icon. You can also use that or else you can use one of these links here which says get Docker Community Edition. I would prefer using this one here. Say get Docker for Windows. It says download from Docker Store. So you'll see get Docker C for Windows. This is a stable channel and then this is the Edge channel. This has got all the cutting edge features and this is the stable version. So I prefer downloading the stable version. Now that we have downloaded it, I'm just going to go ahead and install it. I'm going to check on launch Docker. It would ask you a question saying, Hyper-V Hyper feature is not enabled. Do you want to enable it for Docker to be able to work properly? Your computer will restart automatically. And it also says Docker toolbox will no longer work. Docker toolbox is apparently an older version of the operating, uh, older version of Docker. So I'm just going to click OK. So my system did restart. Docker was installed successfully. I also got an icon here, which is a shortcut for both the Visual Studio Code and Docker for Windows. Now, if I navigate to the, um, to the taskbar, you'll find that there is a Docker icon and then it says Docker is running. If you click on this, it'll say about Docker, where you can go and check the version of Docker you're running. It says 17.03.0 CE, which is a stable version. And you can also upgrade Docker from within here. You can go into settings. It says start Docker when you log in. I would uncheck it. Automatically check for updates. I would keep it checked in. Send usage statistics. Um, I would just keep it checked in. Shared drives. I will go over this a little later. Advanced basically says what's the allocation of the virtual machine in terms of the CPU and the memory. Um, the the virtual machine is basically sitting on this. Uh, the hypervisor was used for this, basically. So we have two CPUs running with two gigs of RAM allocated for Docker. The network, the proxies, the daemon, uh, you know, you can set to advanced and basic. I'm just going to keep it as is. And then it says Docker is running. Now, restarting Docker should be done through this. If you want to set it to factory defaults, I highly recommend doing this. Um, clicking on this and then getting it reset to factory defaults. Now let's go check out to see if Docker is actually working. So what I would do is I'm going to open the PowerShell. This is Windows PowerShell. Right click and this I'm just going to pin it to the taskbar. Click on it. Just do Docker version. So if Docker is installed correctly, you should be able to see the version here. Now, I'm just going to highlight this section here. It says the Docker server was 17.03.0.ce. .0 .0 .0 C denotes the community edition. As you can see, the server is written in the Go language. Um, the git commit, it's an experimental version. Um, the client, on the other hand, has a version too. So as you can see, it's Windows AMD 64. So that's about it. As far as Docker is concerned, you can also try using docker-v to get a shortened version of the version. And uh, that's about it for as far as installation of Docker is concerned. One last step before we wrap up the installation instructions is to get started with our first act of playing with Docker. So basically, just like every other programming language has a hello world, we're going to do a hello world with Docker. So open up the PowerShell on Windows and execute the following command. Uh, when I actually have it in double quotes, it's really not in double quotes. Um, this will help you understand the interaction of the Docker client, which you're running on the terminal. 
So that said, I am going to run that right now and give you a demo. So let's get started. The other thing I highly recommend doing is to again go back to the Docker uh, on the taskbar. If you see the switch to Windows containers, we're going to be working with Linux images. So I highly recommend that that be um, on Linux container and not Windows container. So if you by any chance see a switch to Linux container on this taskbar, I highly recommend switching. In this case, it's already in a Linux container, so I'm not going to do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically navigate to the desktop where we have all our samples. And uh, <clears throat> you really don't need to, but then I'm just going to run a few commands here. So in order to check if everything is working OK, I highly recommend executing this command. Docker run hyphen IT um, hello hyphen world. And then what it's going to do is it's going to look for an image locally. If it can't find that image, Docker is going to pull that image. Uh, this is a very important step in terms of finding if your Docker installation is working OK. So let me go through the steps here. It says unable to find image locally. So what it's going to do is it's going to connect to the Docker hub and pull that image. Uh, so here it's downloaded the new image. So it says hello from Docker. So that's basically the indication that Docker is working correctly. The second thing to note is this particular section here is very, very important to understand what is going on. So the Docker client, it says how do, what, what, what happened along with this process. So it says the Docker client contacted the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon pulled the hello world image from the Docker hub. The Docker daemon created a new container from that image, which runs the executable that produces the output you're currently reading, which is in this case, hello from Docker. The Docker daemon streamed that output to the Docker client, which sent it to your terminal. So this, I highly recommend reading it a few times to get a feel of what's going on here. But you don't have to worry about it. As we go through the lectures, you will get a feel of what it is. Um, so I will leave it at that for now. Uh, thank you for watching the installation instructions. I look forward to seeing you in the future lectures. Let's have a quick recap of Docker. Uh, we will go through whatever we've learned so far. So what is the Docker platform? Um, Docker, as we know, provides the ability to build, ship, and run applications. So uh, build and ship would mean to package it and run an application in a loosely isolated environment called a container. Uh, the isolation and security allow you to run many containers on a given host. So this is probably an interview question in case uh, you're going in for an interview and somebody had to ask you about what is Docker. You would definitely need to mention build, ship, and run and the fact that the container uh, is basically running on a loosely isolated environment and many containers can be run on a given host. We also looked at what is a Docker engine. I had mentioned that just like a car needs an engine, Docker needs an engine. This slide is a little bit more descriptive of what a Docker engine is. As you can see, the Docker engine consists of the, the CLI or the command line interface a REST API, which can be used by the CLI to interact with the server. Um, so the server is basically nothing but the Docker daemon, as I showed you on during the, pro, during the time of installation. Um, and as we all know, the Docker engine manages the volumes, the network, the container, and also manages the images. So that is a long story short. This may be a very important slide and also another interview question. Um, so highly recommend going through these slides once again. So the other thing we learned is about Docker version. So Docker version on the command line will give you the version of the client and on the server. Um, so I think that's about it for this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you. The most important thing before you start the use case, now that you've installed Visual Studio Code, and Docker for Windows along with GitHub, is to be able to make sure that Docker for Windows is running. So if you click on this, you should see that in your taskbar, it says Docker is running. That's step number one. Step number two is to make sure that you see switch to Windows containers, which means that Docker is currently running on a Linux container, which is what we want. So I repeat, that we want to make sure that Docker is running on a Linux container. So you should see the switch to Windows container option here. Number two. Number three is you will need to fire up PowerShell on Windows and go into Docker version and you should see both the client and the server. Number four, go into Docker machine 
version and you should see the machine version of Docker. Number five is to use Docker Compose version and should see the Docker Compose version. Apart from this, I also recommend keeping an eye on docs.docker.com. All of the documentation is going to be available on docs.docker.com and uh, I highly recommend that you get you have a sneak peek of whatever is going on here and uh, if you run into anything just click on the troubleshooting section or the user guide I will go over all the important phases with you uh, you don't need anything extra as far as the use cases are concerned but keep this as a reference material all right thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture now that you're done with the installation the first thing to note before you start the real-world use cases is to make sure that Docker on this taskbar is running. This should say running. Number two is to fire up a terminal, click on Docker version, and you should see the version of the client and of the server. So when I say client and server, I'm talking to the one which is highlighted here. The next thing to do is to make sure that the Docker machine is installed as well. So if you click on Docker hyphen machine version, you should see Docker machine version as something. The next thing to do is to make sure Docker Compose is working and this should give you a version as well. It took a while, but make sure you wait on it. So only if these three are installed, that means your Docker examples are good to go. Thank you for watching this lecture and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks. Welcome everyone to use case number one. As a part of use case number one, we are going to host a website of PictoLearn on multiple Docker containers running on the same host machine using the Apache HTTP server. As you can see on the image, we have infrastructure or server on the bottom. The host operating system sits on top of the server and then we have Docker engine on top of the OS. And then we're going to run two containers, each containing Apache HTTP server with a customized website running on them. So as a part of this lecture, you're going to, you're going to learn how to build a custom image from a Docker file. Uh, apart from that, uh, you're going to learn how to run multiple containers out of an image with, the, with your website hosted on it. And then some very important Docker CLI commands. So long story short, this is the flow diagram of what we are going to do as a part of this use case. You basically have a Docker file. We're going to use the Docker file to build an image of HTTPD server with a website to be hosted. We're going to learn how to list all images, inspect images, run multiple containers from the image and then inspect the containers, show all the containers which are running and stopped, maybe view container logs and also to start and stop the container. I know this is very, very abstract, but you will get used to it once we start the lessons. Here is a more detailed stack of the image we are going to build. We have, as I said, the infrastructure, the operating system, the Docker engine. And on top of that, we actually have the Apache HTTP image from Docker Hub. I will get to it in a little bit. And then on top of that, we have the Apache HTTPD image with custom httpd.conf and Pictolearn website. Now this image is gonna look like this and we're gonna call this image my HTTPD image. Now let's get started on building, shipping and running the image. In this lecture, we're gonna look at the definition of a Docker image. In order to give you the easiest definition possible, I've created an analogy between the Docker image and the camera. The, when I say the camera, it's not the digital camera, it's still the old age analog camera with a negative film on it. So if you see the first row, just like a user takes the film, puts it in a camera and then takes an image which forms a negative film. And then from the negative film, he basically derives the photographs. So similarly, in the second row, the negative film is nothing but the Docker file. The Docker file has all the chemical components. When I say chemical components, it's analogous to uh, the negative film. 
It contains all the instructions to create a Docker image. And from the Docker image, you can create as many containers as you want. So that's the easiest definition of how you can perceive a Docker image. So let's see how we can go ahead and build Docker. The first thing we are going to do as a part of the use case flow is to review the Docker file. Now let's open Visual Studio Code and then navigate to the folder where we have all the samples installed. I just want to quickly go over the structure of this directory. As you can see, all of the samples are specified with a number and then you, all, you have use case one through use case 10. There are some basic Docker commands enlisted here, which you can, uh, which you can also try out. Apart from that, there, are some res there is a resources folder which talks about install scripts. And then there's a scripts.txt, which basically gives you a summary of all the commands we're going to use. This is kind of uh, a cheat sheet, which you can use after the course is complete. So let's get started with use case one, because we've been talking about it right now. So if you see, look at use case one, we have a directory called picto learn sample. Now this has a, a website. Uh, it has a few web pages to be uh, accurate. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go and say reveal in Explorer as far as Windows is concerned. And then um, if you look at the PictoLearn sample, the goal is to be able to host a website which looks like this. So this should launch up on the container. Obviously, we're going to hit it through the server. So that's the number one. Number two is we have the Docker file, which is going to determine how the Docker image is going to get created. And then we also have a scripts.txt. So the scripts.txt is an easy to learn mechanism. Um, I'm not going to type all the commands. I'm just going to copy the commands from here to the, to the terminal and then show you how this works. You can follow the same. This way we save on time and you can learn it faster. And obviously I'm going to go over each and every command and give you a synopsis of what it is doing. So, um, and we also have the httpd.conf file, uh, which I'm going to customize as far as Apache HTTP server is concerned. So let's take a look at the Docker file. The Docker file basically says from httpd colon latest. So I've given annotations on the Docker file for ease of understanding. All this is saying is download Apache HTTPD server and, and that to the latest version from the Docker Hub. So I want to give you a glimpse of Docker Hub. So let's go to hub.docker.com. And then um, this is a repository, just like we have the Maven repository, which contains all the jar files and the dependencies. Docker, again, owns a repository and also uh, allows you to install directly from the repository. So this voids the software engineer or Unix engineer to get the image, install it on the prompt. So let's take a look at this. I just searched for HTTPD. So the first thing I get is an official repository of Apache HTTP server. Look for the word official. And as you can see, it's got 10 million pulls and 971 stars. So I will click on this to go take a look at it. So as you can see, it says supported tags and respective Docker file links. So if you click on the tags, it's got all the versions of Docker which you want to install. So you can specify whatever version. By default, I have specified latest, but you could also say 2-alpine and it's going to give you that particular image. So what I'm going to do is, all this is saying is download this image from the Docker repository. Okay, this is a very important command, so please make a note of this. The second line say, states, the maintainer. This is an optional parameter and this basically refers to the author of the file. The third thing we're going to look at is we're going to copy this directory from here to the image which we're downloading. Now remember we are customizing an already existing version of Apache HTTP server. So we download it, we specify a maintainer, we copy this into this particular directory. And I'll tell you in a little bit what that means. But as you go through the future lectures, you will understand what it means. So uh, for those of you who know Apache HTTP server, you would have known that the pages are served from uh, user local Apache to HTT docs. And uh, I'll get to it in a little bit. So this is the configuration I have made in httpd.conf. So as you can, if you go to httpd.conf and then control F, that particular um, path, you're going to see the document root and the directory have been modified here. 
So this is going to serve the index.html page from this as the root directory. All right. So and then I'm all I'm doing is I'm copying the httpd.conf as is from here to the image. So this is a very simple Docker file. Um, and so uh, let's get started on seeing how we can create the Docker image. Now let's take a look at how we can build an image from the um, Docker file with the website to be hosted. The next thing I'm going to do is to be able to fire up PowerShell. So I have PowerShell. You can basically go into uh, here and search for the PowerShell or I actually have it as a shortcut. So I'm just going to open it. I'm just going to go back to this um, directory. I'm going to say right click on it and say copy path and then I'm going to go to that path. OK, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start executing the scripts one by one. So as we saw in the start of the lecture, the first goal is to be able to build an image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this line here. It says docker build hyphen t my httpd and then it says a dot. So I'm just going to copy it right here. So as you can see, I'm just using docker. The build says I want to build an image. Hyphen t is nothing but tty. We'll get to it in a little bit. Uh, as far as summary is concerned, I will summarize this dash t a little bit more clearly. Just know that for now that the, what it's saying is the output is the terminal. So this is the image name. So my httpd and then it has a dot. So uh, the dot basically signifies the location of the Docker file. So what I'm going to do is it's going to run it. So as you can see here, the first thing it does is to be able to go to Docker Hub and retrieve the image from Docker Hub. It is downloading it to your uh, local file system and uh, it basically reads the Docker file. Boom. So we have created our first image. Congratulations, uh, team members. So let's take a look at how this is being done. Now let's take a look at how to list all the images. Now that we have built the image, we want to be able to know how to query and list all the images. So now that we have the Docker image, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list all the images in the system. And the command to do that is given right here. So I'm just going to say Docker images. As you can see, there are two images. The HTTPD image is the first image uh, which we see and then there's a my HTTPD image. So let's take a look at the attributes here. So when you do Docker images, it basically enlists all the images which you have on your system. The, the first attribute here is called the repository. It gives you the name of the image. In our case, we named it my HTTPD. So you see my HTTPD here. And after that, you have the tag, which is the latest. I'm going to go over how to tag images as a part of the build ship run use case. It has a uniquely generated image ID and it was created about a minute ago. And it also specifies the size of the image. As you can see, the original image which was downloaded from Docker Hub was HTTPD image. It has the latest and then we uh, it has a unique ID and this was checked in 13 days ago. As you can see, this is smaller than the image which we created only because we basically moved the httpd.conf and uh, if you see we did these two instructions which basically said move this directory as is which has our web page to this location and also move the httpd.conf which is the customized version of our image um, so so let's go back to the terminal and uh, let's look at how we can inspect the image now let's take a look at how we can inspect an image. Inspecting an image provides valuable metadata information and can be used for debugging purposes. Um, and you will get to know a little bit more about the image you just built. So as a part of inspecting the image, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, Docker inspect the image ID. So as you can see, this is what I've specified on the scripts file. It says docker inspect image ID and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove the image ID and then just going to plug this in here. And if I look at this, as you can see right from the top, 
When I did Docker inspect, it's going to give you some metadata information about the image. It gives you the SHA, which is a unique ID. As you can see, the image ID presented here uh, on this section, especially here, is the shortened version of the ID which you see here. Okay, And then it also talks to you about the name of the image, the tag of the image, uh, are there any parents? So if you see the parent here is 524D93, and then you will see that the parent is basically nothing but the Apache HTTPD image which got downloaded from Docker Hub. Apart from that, it's also got some other useful information. Now, the reason why you need to know this is because you will need to understand that Im this image was written on top of an existing image, and the existing image was Apache HTTP server as is, uh, and that's the original image. And this is basically the, uh, the customized image. All right, so we basically covered three sections here. One is we saw how we can uh, build an image, which is this command, which you see right here. And then we saw how to view all the images and then how to inspect an image. Congratulations on building our first image. Here is what we completed as a part of this lecture. Just to summarize, our goal was to build a customized version of HTTPD image. So as a part of this process, we understood the working of a Docker file. We learned the command to build a custom image and we called the image my HTTPD image. We used Docker CLI to list all images available in the system and also to inspect the image. Now let's go ahead with the next lecture. Thank you for watching. Now let us take a look at how to build multiple containers from the image we just built. Step four of this exercise is to run a container from the image. As you can see, I provided the syntax for running the container from an image. It takes in the do it uses the docker run command and then these are some parameters which have been explained below hyphen name is the name of the container hyphen p is the port which the host maps to the container and then you provide an image name with the tag or you also you could provide an image id so hyphen d here represents the detached mode as you can see i will go over one of the examples as a as to run a container with a detached mode hyphen p as you, as you can see here represents the host port to port mapping. If you give a capital P, it will automatically assign a port. So we will go over that example as well. So let's get started with the example. I basically navigated to um, uh, the PowerShell to the current working directory. In case you're starting this lecture fresh, please make sure that you're in the current working directory. Um, it really doesn't matter, but it's better to do that so that we are all consistent. So I'm just going to copy this, paste this. I provided a name for the container called my HTTP container. As you can see, when I click enter, it basically generates a random number, which is basically the SHA, which is a unique ID to the container. Let me paste the other one as well. So I'm running two containers here. The next thing we are going to do is to list all the containers. The next step is to look at step five. I'm just going to jump a little bit and then come back to step four again. So we're going to show all containers which are running. So let's take a look at this. So I'm just going to copy this command and then paste it here. As you can see, there are two containers which are running. So let's take a look at how these containers are running. The first attribute which you see here is called the container ID. As you can see, this is the longer version of the container ID and this is the shorter version. The docker ps command gives you only the running containers and we will talk about the stopped containers later. It provides the image from which it was built. It gives you the command which is running as default inside the container. It says it was created two minutes ago and status is up two minutes ago and then it also provides you the ports. Uh, as to when or what port in the host machine is mapped to what port inside the container and the same goes with container number two. So they're pretty identical. So let's take a look at how these containers function. So our goal as you as you're aware is to launch our own customized version of the container of the HTTPD image and to host a website with it. So let's see 5556. So if I look at this, as you can see, this is running within the container. So if I go into 5555, That's also running a server. 
Now, the thing here is that we actually gave, we ran these containers in a detached mode, that's the hyphen D version. Now let's take it looking the running the container without the detached version. So let's go back here and I want to run this fourth command, which basically um, says I want to run this container with um, in the deta uh, detached in the non-detached mode. I'm just going to name it not detached. And then I'm going to run this here. So as you can see, if it's not running in the detached mode, it's going to start up the container with the process ID of one, which is the first uh, command which gets run inside the container. Now what we've done is we started it at 5557. So the disadvantage of doing that is, and I can show you 5557 first. The disadvantage of doing this is the moment I do control C and get out of it, get out of the shell, I cannot access um, the page again. So it's always good to run the container in detached mode. The last thing I wanted to show you is to be able to assign a random port. So let's say for a given use case, I don't want to specify a port like 5556. So what I could do is basically I could just skip the port. And then if you see Docker PS, it's going to specify all the ports which are running. But if you see here, 32768, that's mapped to port 80, which Nginx is running on. So if I go to localhost, 32768, it's going to bring up the web page. So this is one way to basically run on a random port. As I said, hyphen hyphen name is completely optional. If you don't specify it, it's not going, it's going to assign a random name. All right. So let's take a look at one more command, which is docker ps hyphen a. This will enlist all the stopped and started containers. So when we get to that point, I will go, I will actually reiterate this, but just be aware that this is going to show up uh, all the started and stopped containers. So as far as um, this lecture, you have learned how to run multiple containers from an image, how to list containers. And you also try to experiment by going and hitting the container on the browser, just like this. So a lot of exciting stuff your way. So let's check it out. Now we're going to take a look at how to inspect a container. The next thing we're going to do is to inspect the container, just like we inspected the image. So I'm just going to do docker ps hyphen a, and then I'm going to say docker inspect for example, as you can see, this provides all the metadata information of the container. So let's uh, take a look at what metadata information. As you can see, this provides the long, yeah, long form of the unique ID. This is the shortened version. And then it talks about when this was created, when this was paused, when it was finished, started. Uh, it also provides the SHA of the image ID from which this was created. It provides the path to the logs in the container, the host name. So this information may be very helpful in resolving any errors or uh, debugging or you know troubleshooting um, aspects as far as the use case is concerned. It has a local gateway. It has a local IP address where it is mapped to. It has the MAC address. So typically you're running, as I said, a computer within a computer. So it provides a lot of useful information. Just know that this is a, de a starting point to uh, debug or troubleshoot. Now let's take a look at how we can view the container logs. Once the container starts up, it is possible to view the logs as well. Let's take a look at the command. We are in step seven. So in order to view the logs of the container, I'm just going to go back to the PowerShell. I'm going to do docker ps hyphen a get all the latest and greatest containers which are running. And then I'm going to do docker logs container ID. So you can just specify the container ID and then it will show you all the logs. Now let's say you want to do a rolling logging, which means you want to tail the logs when the container gets started up. This is a very important command for troubleshooting and debugging. So all you will need to do this is to add a dash FT to it. So I'm just going to add docker logs hyphen FT 
and as and when the requests come in it is going to um, basically poll so since we started with five 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 uh, six I would assume or maybe it was a different this is three two seven six eight so I'm just gonna go three two seven six eight and click on refresh a few times and as you can see the logs start to roll um, So you can see the logs is coming up so you can always do control C and eject out of it so this is about logging the container logs now coming to the last part of a lecture which is to be able to start and stop containers now let's take a look at that now what I've done is I've listed all the containers which are running as you can see one of the containers has exited which was one of the detached containers so you can actually do docker ps and then just look at the containers which are running. I like to do docker ps hyphen a if I'm looking at containers which have started and stopped. This is something which you have to note. The second thing we're going to do right now is we're going to stop a container. So the command for that is very simple. You're just going to go ahead and click docker stop container ID. So you can just type it docker stop and then you can specify this container ID and it's just going to stop. You can just do docker ps hyphen a and it says that it's exited. So if you go back to the web page, it is no longer going to be accessible. It just keeps rolling. Um, and then if you want to start it again, you just do Docker start container ID, and then it's going to start it up. And then you can go back and then you can just click on this and it should bring you back the web page it's still starting. So it's possible that it assigned a new ID. That's the reason it's not starting. So let's go take a, oh, you can see this. This is a new port which is assigned. So 32769. So as you can see, it started with a new port because this was one of the detached, or it was one of the instances which we started with a random port. Now let's try the Docker stop with one of those which we actually know the port for. Once I stop it, I go back 5556 is no longer accessible and then I basically start so as you can see it's come back again so that's about starting and stopping containers and as I said you can just do docker ps to look at all the started running containers and docker ps hyphen a to look at all the stopped and started containers as you can see one of them is stopped right here just something for you to remember so that's for this lecture let's quickly summarize now let's quickly summarize what we learned as a part of the lecture we learned how to run multiple containers from an image in detached mode in non-detached mode and also with a random port we also saw how to list all containers running and stopped inspect those containers get some metadata information from them for troubleshooting and debugging we saw how to view the container logs and also how to stop and start containers so thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. The next part of the lecture is going to focus on logging into the container and inspecting. If you remember correctly, we had two instructions in the Docker file which had to do with modifying the container which we modifying the image which we obtained from Docker Hub for Apache HTTP. D. So the first one was to uh, copy a directory. We copied our website directory to use a local Apache to HT docs. And we also copied httpd.conf, which we had customized on top of the existing Apache HTTPD image. So we're going to take a look at what happens inside the container. In order to best demonstrate this use case, I'm going to um, get a container ID which is running. So if I do ps-a, it's going to give me all stopped and started containers. And as you can see, I have the container ID which starts with a D8. I'm just going to keep a copy of this. And then what I'm going to do is basically um, go into docker file and then um, look for these two commands make sure that I am aware of the directories here and then I'm going to go to script scripts.txt copy this particular command I'm going to paste it right here and then this is the way I can log into the container so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the d8 which is the unique ID I can actually just do d8 and it should work I don't even need to do uh, docker automatically finds out so as you can see, I'm logged into the container. 
Now the first thing I want to show you is when I do a ps-ef grep1. I'm just going to do one right now because I want to show you the first process ID here. The first process ID is logged in as root and then it starts HTTPD in the foreground. Now remember that every image which you download from Docker Hub or even if the one you create, you are going to have the first process ID as the as uh, uh, what is the default startup script or default container which has to be launched from that image. So in case of Apache HTTPD, we all know that it's it started up as a root and that's process number one. So this may be an interview question in case you're going to get interviewed on Docker. The second thing I want to show you is I'm going to navigate to this directory. Now we copied two files. Uh, if you remember, we copied a directory called pictolearn, which has our website, and we also copied httpd.conf. So let's navigate into this website, uh, this directory here, cd, and as you can see, you see uh, pictolearn, which was copied over when the image was created. And if I go back one step and log into the conf directory, and then you have the httpd.conf, and as you can see, uh, the httpd.conf was copied very recently on March the 13th uh, at 3.06, which is different from the timestamps you see on the other uh, files. And this is very important going forward for debugging, troubleshooting, problem solving. You'll get a better idea of this as we go into the other lectures. But long story short, if I do a cat on httpd.conf and then grep on pictolearn, you're going to see these two lines, which basically were modified when we created the image. So going back to this, I'm just going to show you these two lines, which were added by us. So what really happened is we downloaded the Apache HTTP image, customized it and created our own image. So these were the two customizations done as a part of this process. Now we'll get into this in more detail as we go into the other use cases. But for now, just know that there is a command for you to execute, to troubleshoot, problem solve. In case you're trying to do this Docker file all by yourself, um, you'll run into issues. This is one of the ways to start debugging. So that's it guys for this lecture. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thanks. The last thing we want to do for use case one is to remove the containers and the images we created. So let's go take a look at it. Now let's get started in understanding how to remove images and containers. Go to the last section of this uh, scripts text and you'll see there are four commands. The first one signifies how to remove a specific container based on a container ID. The next one is to remove all containers. And then the subsequent one is to remove an image by image ID and then remove all images. Now I want to show you three things here. The first constraint here when you're trying to remove an image or a container, for example, is let's say Docker images. Let's say I try to remove this image. It says I cannot remove this image because it is being used by a running container. So let's see. I have one running container starting with 1B338F120C7F and that's what is being stated here. I cannot remove this image at all. Now let's say I try to remove this image here. Now note that docker rmi is for removing an image, rm is for removing a container. It says this has independent child images. So what you can see from here is this my httpd image was in turn created from the httpd image which was downloaded from the docker hub. So somebody from the Apache Foundation created this image, checked it into docker hub and then now we're trying to delete this image and it says you can't delete it because we've written an image on top of an existing image as a part of this use case. So something to keep in mind. So let's go to containers right now and try to stop and remove containers. So let's say I remove the first container. It's going to say no such, sorry, I used the wrong command. Just note that this is an RM. So it says you cannot remove a running container stop the container before attempting to do so. This is a very important constraint. So you will need to stop a container to remove a container. So let's go ahead and stop it. Well, we already have a stopped container. So I'm just going to remove this container here. As you can see, I'm just adding RM instead of RMI. Boom, just got removed. So as you can see, that container is gone. 
So let's say we want to stop all containers. I just, I'm just going to do docker stop. I can either do docker stop and then do this. Or I can also use this command. Instead of saying rm, I could just do stop here. And then it will remove all containers. So just be aware of it. You don't need to use it. Removing has to be done with caution. So I've removed all the containers. So I have two options right now. I can either remove all images or I can remove image by image ID. So I'm going to try out all images now that we know that by image ID you can always remove. So say it's unable to delete. Image is being used by stopped container. Let's see what's going on here. So we stopped the container. We did not remove the container. So I'm just going to do this magic command here. I'm just going to remove all containers. As you can see, it's removed all containers. So we should be good to go ahead and remove all images. So this is the command to remove all images. As you can see, it's removed all the images. And just to give you a clear picture, as you see, we don't have any images or any containers. This concludes this lecture series of use case one. I hope you had a good time. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Until then, bye. Congratulations on finishing the first use case. As a part of this use case, just to summarize, we created our own HTTPD image, which was a custom image with a custom file and we hosted our website on top of it. As a part of this use case, we learned how to build a Docker file, build an image from a Docker file, run multiple containers from that image. We listed images and containers. We did some inspection on the images and containers with the metadata, started and stopped containers. We ran containers in detached mode and attached mode. We, we viewed container logs. Um, I also taught you how to tail container logs. We logged into containers to see how the files are copied over from the Docker file. We tried removing images and containers. Now that said, this is this forms the foundation of all the use cases we're going to see for starting right now. So um, I highly recommend that you are very thorough with whatever we just learned. And uh, as you would have noticed, people on the Mac, um, the commands are going to be the same as in Windows. Just that I wanted them to also take advantage of not just the Windows, but also the Mac in terms of understanding how things are done. So uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thank you again for viewing and going through use case one. Welcome to use case number two. The use case number two is very similar to use case one. We just removed Apache HTTPD and replaced it with Nginx. But from a learning perspective, you're not only going to learn how to host a website of PictoLearn running on multiple Docker containers using Nginx, but also you're going to learn how to push an image to Docker Hub pull an image from Docker Hub and the whole concept of build, ship and run using Docker. So let's get started. What we're going to do as a part of this use case, as you can see, is you have the infrastructure of the server. On top of it, you have the uh, host operating system. And then on top of that, you have the Docker engine. And on top of the Docker engine, you have the Nginx image, which we are going to get from Docker Hub, very similar to the Apache HTTPD image. And after that, you have your custom image. By which you built by modifying nginx.conf and hosting a PictoLearn website. Now let's call this my nginx image. So let's take a look at the use case flow. We're going to create a Docker file, build an image of HTTP server with a website to be hosted with that Docker file, run multiple containers from that image. We're going to log into the container and verify the files. So until this point, it's very similar to what we did in use case one, except for a few steps which are missing. So what we're going to do here is, apart from what we learned in US ca use case one would be to create an account with Docker Hub, create a repository in Docker Hub, push Docker image to the repository, remove image from the local, and then pull Docker image and then try running it again. So this is going to kind of simulate a build, ship and run philosophy, assuming that a developer would develop an image, put it into a repository, and then a QA engineer or a DevOps engineer would get the image and deploy it into the respective environments, including production. So let's take a look at what, how this can be done. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Now let's open Visual Studio Code, navigate into use case number two. If you click on use case number two, you're going to see the same PictoLearn 
directory sample, just like you saw here with, with use case one. You're gonna see the default.conf file, which is very similar to httpd.conf. You're gonna find a readme, which is gonna talk a little bit about what's being done here. And then you're gonna have the Docker file, which, we, uh, which is our Bible for uh, creating the image. And you have scripts.txt, which is basically um, the set of instructions you're gonna to execute to see what's going on with this um, use case. So that said, let's look into the Docker file. So Docker file, we basically are looking at downloading Nginx 1.10. We could ch change it to whatever version we want. So let's fire up Docker Hub. I'm gonna to go to hub.docker.com. Search for Nginx. You have find the official repository here. Now remember the official repository is the repository we need to look into, not the other ones. If you see, this has got 10 million pulls and 5.6K stars. So let's take a look at the details. So the latest version looks like it's 1.11, but guess what? I'm gonna try out 1.10. You can also make this latest. Instead of 1.10, you can just do latest, but I'm just gonna stick with 1.10. The maintainer is PictoLearn. The maintainer is nothing but the author. And then I have two files which I need to copy. I need to copy this file here, which has got the change in the root. So I move the root location to PictoLearn. And then I have this PictoLearn directory. So as you can see, I'm first copying the default.conf and then copying the PictoLearn sample directory. So let's get started with the scripts now that you know how to build the Nginx image. So I'm just gonna open up PowerShell, navigate to the directory. As you can see, I'm saying docker build hyphen t my nginx, which is the name of my image. And then the location to the Docker file is represented as a dot. It has started to pull the nginx image from the Docker hub. And as I said, we're using 1.10 and not the latest. So this is a good example to know that we could pull in any version of the image. So as it gets downloaded, the Docker image is going to be built and it is built. So let's take a look at what's in the image. Let's go back to list all images. And as you can see, there are two images right now. One is called Nginx and the other one is called My Nginx. So My Nginx was the image downloaded from the Docker Hub. My Nginx was created on top of Nginx with a different image ID. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spawn two containers. So I'm just gonna execute these commands. Again, all of this is done so that you can learn quickly, understand the concepts and move on. So I'm gonna run it with the name of my Nginx container. I'm gonna run it in detached mode, as you can see. I'm gonna give it a port name, which actually 777 is the name of the host port, which is gonna to map to port 80 of Nginx. So I'm gonna run two containers like this. one on 7777 and 7778. We're gonna see the containers. Let's see if we have any stopped containers as well. No stopped containers as you can see. So let's go check it out on the browser. As you can see, it's running Nginx Docker image. And then I'm gonna to go to localhost 7778 and it's gonna run this image. So that said, the next thing for us to do is to go into the login to the bash shell. So I'm just gonna do the container ID or I can do the name of the container as well, which is my Nginx container, but it's always safe to do the container ID. As you can see, I logged into the first container. Let me clear the screen. So. Let's look at the files we copied as a part of Docker file. We copied the default.conf to etc nginx.conf.d. So I'm just gonna cd into that. And then I'm gonna look at default.conf. And as you can see, you see the change which we made, which is basically the one which you see here, which I'm highlighting right now. That said, let's take a look at where the pictolearn directory is copied. As you can see, pictolearn sample is, gets copied to pictolearn. So I'm just gonna go into this directory here. 
So as you see, the pictolearn directory is available right here. So there we are. We have basically not just built an image. We basically constructed a container. We also executed um, the execute command and logged into the container. Uh, we could also check the logs as a part of this exercise. So I'm just going to do docker logs. Exit out of the container, docker ps a, and then I'm going to say docker logs. As you can see, the logs are there. If I want to tail the logs, I can do hyphen ft and then tail the logs. As easy as that. All right. So now let's go into the fun part of trying to building, shipping, and running images. As you can see, right now we have two images. So let's see how we can build, ship, and run these images. The next thing I'm going to show you is to go into Docker Hub, go into hub.docker.com and you may want to sign up here. As you can see, you can choose the Docker ID, put in your email and choose a password. I already did that exercise, so I highly recommend going and creating yourself an account on Docker Hub. You can click on sign in and then go and log in with your ID. In my case, my login ID is pictolearn. So what I'm going to do is create a repository. So creating a repository means that you're going to house all your images. So what's going to happen is once a developer creates an image, as it moves through QA, UAT, and production, everybody is going to run off the image. So let's take an example here. Let's say the DevOps team is going to basically create a, a repository for you, and let's call it Nginx repository for Pictolearn. This is the Nginx repository for Pictolearn. And then if you want to put in more details, you can put it in here. The visibility is public right now. If you choose a private repository, uh, you actually have to pay. So I'm going to demonstrate this with a public repository. So right now, this particular repository has been created. So let's see how we can commit our image to this repository. As you can see, we have created a repository. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for my profile. As you can see, this is the username. So remember the username. Your email could be anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to PowerShell. I listed all the images. Let's say this is the image I want to ship. I've already built the image as a part of shipping it to let's say a dev or QA or UAT or production. All I need to give the DevOps team is just this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first log into the Docker repository. So for that, you just need to do a Docker login. And I already gave in a username. If you're not given a username, you could still continue to use this username. So. I'm just going to log in to the repository. So it says login succeeded, which means I'm connected to the repository on the Docker Hub. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a tag of this image. So in order to create a tag, you're just going to go back to the scripts folder. And you can see this is the image. This is the command to create a tag. So the first thing to do would be to tag the image. So as far as repository name, I'm just going to name it as pictolearn and then image name is nginx and then I'm going to say tag is 1.0 and then I'm going to go into the current image which is basically my nginx. So I'm going to just going to provide a name here and then I'm also going to provide a tag here which is latest. So in this case, this is the tag which I'm going to give. So what I'm going to do is what basically I'm creating a tag. So once I do this, if I go into Docker images, as you can see, I've created a tag of this image. This image is a snapshot of this image which you see here. But as you can see, the even the IDs are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this into the repository. So in order to push this into the repository, the easiest way to do that would be to copy this command. I'm just going to push it to repository number 1.0 and just, I'm just going to say nginx pick to learn. And I'm going to push it. So 
So as you can see, it's already pushed. So let's go into Docker Hub, refresh this page, go into tags. As you can see, I just pushed this image. The size of the image was 72 MB, and then this was last updated a few seconds ago, and the tag name is 1.0. Now let's say, for example, I remove all the containers and the images. So for example, let's assume that developer is done with his task and let's assume I take on the role of a QA. So what I would do on the QA machine is, so let's first remove all of the images here. So I'm just gonna do docker ps and a and it's gonna say docker stop. And then I can do consecutive IDs. It's gonna stop both of them. Then I'm gonna remove those IDs. And then I'm gonna go back to the images. And then I'm just gonna remove all the images which I see. So a quick command for that would be as follows. So it says it's got a conflict. So I'm just gonna remove it one by one. Docker RMI. colon 1.0 untagged so if you look at this the tagged image is removed so I'm just gonna do try out that thing again so so as you can see everything is deleted let me clear the screen as you can see let's assume starting right now that I am a QA engineer what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rely on the developer to give me an image so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the repo info and just say docker pull pick to learn nginx colon 1.0, okay? What it's gonna do is it's gonna pull my image. So let's see what happens. I'm gonna pull the image and then fire up my containers to see if they launch up. As you can see, I was able to pull down my image, which was 182 MB. And then what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna say docker run hyphen itd hyphen hyphen name my nginx pulled image. I'm just gonna go back here and then copy the port using the same port as the previous one. So I'm just gonna say pick to learn dash nginx colon 1.0. I was able to start a container. Let me do it for one more. Two, seven, 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 eight. As you can see, there are two containers running. So if I go back to seven, 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 and 7778, it should load up. So here we go. We were able to build, ship, and run software. Now going back to the summary, what we did as a part of this use case too was we created a Docker file. We built an image from the Docker file. We ran multiple containers. We tried logging into one of the containers to verify if it had all the files intact. Then we went ahead and created an account with Docker Hub and then created a repository inside Docker Hub. We try to tag the image and then push the image into the repository. We remove the image from the local just to simulate what would happen if we have to build and ship software. Assuming that you've taken the role of a QA or a DevOps engineer, we try to pull the image and run the container again. So I know this is a lot of steps. I highly recommend going through this lecture a few times to get an understanding of what we've learned. So that said, thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. I'm sure your brain is overloaded. So let's go through a quick summary of what we've learned so far. We learned what the Docker file is. We understood that the Docker file is case sensitive. So make sure you use the right case as far as the file name is concerned. The Docker file is used to build a Docker image. The Docker image is nothing but a snapshot. So we also learned that the image uh, in terms of um, the Docker is compared to the negative film of the camera. So once you create a snapshot, you can run as many containers as you want. We've learned that Docker image can be checked into a repository such as Docker Hub. 
The process of checking in an image to Docker Hub includes tagging the image, pushing the image, and then pulling the image. As far as Docker containers, we ran multiple containers using a Docker image. We stopped and started containers. We learned how to run containers in detached mode. We learned how to run containers with random port and with a specified port on the host. We learned how to log into the container to verify the various files which we have copied over. We also learned how to tail and view the container logs. So I hope you had a good time going through the lectures. I highly recommend going through the first two use cases a few times before you can get a good understanding of the next upcoming lectures. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Welcome to use case number three. As a part of this use case, we're going to look at Docker and Git integration. What we're going to do is to create a Hello World Java project, check it into GitHub and create a Docker image automatically from it and then deploy it. So let's see how this can be done. Before we start this use case, there are some prerequisites which you will need to know. You will need to have GitHub desktop for either the Mac or Windows installed on your machine. Apart from that, an open source Java editor like Eclipse, preferably with JDK 8 running on it, and some basic understanding of how you want to clone projects from Git, and a basic understanding of what continuous integration means. Long story short, continuous integration is all about building, shipping, and running as basics. And the, way, the reason I say that is because once you check in the code, it automatically builds it and deploys it to some environment. So we're going to see how all of this is going to fit in as far as this use case is concerned. So let's go take a look at the coding samples. Apart from doing the Docker grid integration as a part of use case three, we're also going to build a custom Ubuntu image. We got, we're going to download the Ubuntu 16.04 image from Docker Hub and we're going to customize it by installing JDK 1.8 VI Editor, MySQL Client, and Maven. Now note that this exercise is very essential for you to understand as we go through the future lectures. So let's see how to get that started. Step one would include opening GitHub Desktop, creating a dummy project, and checking it into GitHub. I'd like you to open Visual Studio Code first and go through this project here. All we're going to use is the Docker file from here. And then we're going to open GitHub desktop. So I'm just going to search for GitHub and then you've got the GitHub shell and also the desktop. I am very familiar with the desktop. If you're familiar with the shell, you can go ahead with the shell. Click on the GitHub for the desktop. It's going to open an interface like this, even on the Mac. All you need to do is you need to say create and then I'm just going to go into desktop docker and then I'm going to create a project called hello world java and I'm going to create a repository. So once it's done I'm just going to publish it as you can see the settings if you go to the repository settings, you will need to make sure that you are connected to the right repositories and you've ignored the right files. So in this case, I am working against um, my repository, which is Pictolearn. You can add an account here. And then I'm just gonna publish it for now. I'm just going to say first hello world docker project once you publish it i highly recommend that you open the browser and go into github.com slash pick to learn and make sure that this project exists the second thing i'm going to do is i'm going to open eclipse we're going to try this again eclipse so I'm going to open Eclipse. The one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open the workspace inside the Docker project. I 
inside hello world.java. This is a fresh installation of Eclipse, possibly the reason why you see it this way. I'm going to go into preferences, go into Java, build path, install JREs, and I'm going to make sure that this has the JDK. So if it doesn't have the JDK, I'm just going to go ahead and add it. I'm going to select that as the default. Now let's go ahead and install the Docker plugin for Eclipse. This instruction of installing the Docker plugin for Eclipse is the same for the Mac and the Windows. So the way you do it is you would go to help and then Eclipse marketplace. It's going to retrieve some data and then you're going to find Docker. So you're going to see a lot of different Docker plugins. I highly recommend installing the Eclipse Docker tooling. Once you install it, the Eclipse IDE is going to restart. I highly recommend that you finish restarting it. I'm just going to pause the lecture until we restart. The next thing we are going to do is to create a Java project in Eclipse called Docker Git Hello World with the package structure of org.pictolearn.docker. We're going to build an image out of it, run a container, verify the use case before understanding what Git can do for us. So let's get started. Now let's right click on this project. Let's go to other, Maven project. Leave the settings as is. Click on Maven Archetype Quick Start. Click on next. Just name this docker git hello world. Create a package called arc pick to learn dot docker. Let's name it 1.0.0. We can use the same artifact ID. Click finish. It's going to give you a project. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that this project is running on JDK 8. So right click on the properties, go to Java build path, go to libraries, Click on JRE system library, edit it, and make sure that it is JDK 8. It actually says J2SE 1.5. So just click on workspace default JDK. Make sure that you have JDK installed in case you haven't followed the previous instruction. So in this case, JDK 8 is already installed. So the next thing to do is you can delete whatever is there in source test Java. Go to pom.xml. And what we want to do is we want to basically copy all of these contents directly from Visual Studio Code. So just go to Visual Studio Code, go into pom.xml from here, copy it as is. The reason why I say that is if you notice this section here, this is very important for our use case. All it's going to do is it's going to install the Maven assembly plugin, which is going to create a jar file out of this project and then give you a executable jar file. So you can just tell the jar file which program you want to run. So I'm just going to go here, right click on this, delete it. And as you can see, the same package structure is here. We're going to create a Java, a Java class called hello world ping. So Just to give you a brief idea of what this is doing, all this is doing is it's running a loop a hundred times and it's going to print hello world ping. It's going to sleep for one second and then it's going to ping. So this exercise is going to give you an idea of how to run a jar file as an executable using Docker. So for that, we also need the Docker file. We're going to right click and you're going to say new file, Docker file. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Docker file here. We're just going to copy it as is and then paste it here. So as a part of this exercise, we're going to create an image from an existing Ubuntu image. Ubuntu is nothing but a Linux kernel. And we're going to create an image from Ubuntu. So 
as I said, we're going to get the image from Ubuntu. The maintainer is nothing but the author of the file. What we're going to do is once we have the Ubuntu image for people who are familiar with Ubuntu, they would know that the first thing to do is to upgrade the operating system to the latest and greatest patches. So what we are doing here is we are installing all the softwares required for us to run Java. We're also installing something to do uh, with ping. Now I'll get to this particular section and this particular section a little later. What I'm doing here is I'm installing the ping command in Ubuntu. Um, just to give you an idea, Ubuntu 16.04 of the Docker image comes with just bad necessities to run something on Ubuntu. So I'm just going to upgrade it, install ping. I'm just going to add this repository, which is going to give us access to installing JDK. And then um, I'm installing the VI editor, the MySQL client. I will update uh, you as to why this has been done in the future lectures. But overall, the idea here is to run this section, which is highlighted. Basically, I'm going to install Oracle 8 JDK by accepting yes. I'm going to install all updates again and install Maven and JDK 8. And then I'm going to move all the current files which you see here into this directory of Ubuntu called user local docker git hello world. And then I'm going to run a CD on that and then go and do Maven assembly. Now what this is going to do is after it copies all the files into that directory, it's going to run um, Maven assembly target and it's going to generate a jar file. Uh, the command apparently tells the, the Docker engine that this is the first command to run once a container is started from the image. So the difference between run and command is run is just a uh, instruction to execute this instruction in the Linux terminal. Add is just to copy a file. And then command is the first instruction to run once a container is spawned from an image. So as you can see, I'm just doing Java hyphen CP. And then I'm trying to do this, um, execute this jar file. And uh, I'm doing, I'm initiating this hello world ping, which is actually nothing but this class file here. So as you can see in real worlds, you will just do in the real world, in case you didn't do Docker, you would just do Java hyphen, something like this, Java hyphen CPs, uh, jar file, and then what class file to run. And this would basically run the class file. So it's very similar to what we are doing here. You'll get an idea of it once I create an image out of this. I want to show you what I'm going to do uh, as far as image creation is concerned. So let's fire up the PowerShell. In case of Mac, you'll fire up the terminal. Let's go into Visual Studio Code. Let's go into the readme file. Copy the command. So I've given instructions here on what you need to do with this. Let's go back here. Build the image. As you know that this is the build command to execute, which is going to create an image called myJavaDocker. As you can see, it's downloading the Ubuntu image. I'm just going to forward it a little bit. So at this point in time, the image was built. So let's take a look at the image. As you can see, this is called my Java Docker. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this image. So if I run this image in detached mode, it's going to spawn a container and I'm going to tail the logs of the container. As you can see, it started to ping. So my goal here is going to be two things. One is I'm going to do an automated build whenever I make changes. Let's say, for example, I change, uh, for example, hello world ping to hi world ping. Git should be able to find that out and then do a build an image automatically, which any team, let's say you are the development team, the QA team or the engineering team can download. So let me show you how this is done. The second thing I wanted to show you is when you build up a client like this, um, image like this, you can actually install so many other things. So even though the image is running right now, I can actually do a hyphen IT and then slash bin slash bash. And I want to show you uh, how this image looks like. So if I go into this file called Docker Hello World, you will see that all of the Docker file and all of the images is here. Um, and also, if you go into this particular directory, you will see that there is a jar file which was built. 
as you can see this is a jar file which was built by, by maven so what we're going to do is the goal here is for you to understand that that is the vi editor so you can just do hello.txt here and then vi would going to come up so the goal of this exercise is to basically let you know that we're going to build this image ship it to github and git is going to automatically build this image in the back end and keep it ready in case anybody in any other team needs to download it so let's see how that's done Just to summarize what we did here, we did uh, build a custom Ubuntu image with the VI editor, the MySQL client, the ping installation, Maven, JDK 8. Now I want you to think about all other use cases in your company where you can use this feature. This will definitely simplify the deployment time. Imagine the number of hours or man hours wasted in trying to install, download Ubuntu, set up the virtual machines, etc., etc. So now that you're shipping an image and we're going to see how Git is going to automatically do the continuous integration and keep the images ready, you will get an idea. But this is a prerequisite for you to understand the complexity of how things can be done so easily with Docker. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. What we're going to see as a part of this lecture is that Docker Hub continues to watch GitHub. If it detects any changes to the source code which you have checked in, it will automatically create a deployable image. So let's see how that's done. What I'm going to do right now is for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to close Eclipse so that all of the files which are not related to Eclipse won't get checked in. So as you can see, I'm just going to go back to Hello World Java and it's going to show me all the files which, um, which I need to check into the Git repository. So I'm just going to say first commit. And then I'm going to sync it up. It's going to move all of the files to GitHub. I could also add the metadata directory to, to the ignore list, which I did not add in this case. But nevertheless, here's what I'm going to do while this is getting checked into the Git. I'm going to go to Docker Hub. As you would have created um, ID, in the past use case, I highly recommend that you, in case you've not, you should create it. Apparently the interface for this has changed today. So I'm just gonna log in. And then, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into settings. In the future, if this interface changes, I highly recommend poking around with the different settings. You'll see a section called link accounts and services. You can just link your GitHub. You can say select and, and then you can unlink it or link it. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go back to my dashboard. I'm going to create an automated build. I'm just going to click on LinkedIn, um, GitHub. And then if you click on this, you will see that all of the projects associated with your GitHub actually show up. In our case, it's called Hello World Docker. Just keep the copy of this information go into and click on that project here, add a description, automated build of Hello World Java. Click here to customize the behavior. This is a very important thing to check. You should add, as you can see, it says master Hello World Java, Docker Git Hello World. So you can just say master and then um, Hello World Java is already a repository here. So just do Docker location as Docker Git Hello World, and then you can create it. So once created, go to build settings and trigger the build. So the first time the image is gonna get automatically created. After it is triggered, go into build details. It says it's building it right now. So let's wait for a few minutes. Once you click on this section, it's gonna load up the Docker file somewhere here. So we'll wait for it to refresh. I did a refresh again on the build details and then the docker file actually showed up which means that the docker file is getting picked from github automatically now the logs are going to show up in a few minutes it's going to take some time because it takes time for docker to build it and show it up here as far as the new announcement they're going to change this interface a little bit if it's a major change i will update the course 
or else it should be pretty self explicable if you have any questions feel free to send me an email so i did a refresh on the build details page and as you can see the log section is actually printing all the logs out so as a part of this exercise the same image is getting built on by docker hub so as far as future of this is concerned i think docker will start charging for it but then for now i think it is free so as you can see the build finish and the image was created so let's go um, to the build details here so if you have any errors you're going to see it it says success which means your build was built successfully you have the build settings here you have the tags here as you can see this is the latest so the repo info is also the latest so what i'm going to do is as a, as a part of the exercise is going to go back here i'm going to delete whatever i have as far as the images are concerned so i'm just going to do the regular way to delete and all the containers and then i'm going to get the container fresh this is the image deletion mechanism so so as you can see there are no images and no containers so if you've logged into the docker account fine if you've not logged in log in again and then you should be able to run this command if you don't specify this it's still so i'm just going to run the container I'm just going to give it D docker log ft 63 as you can see it started to work now the goal here is to be able to make a change to the Java file and have docker automatically build the image now what I'm going to do here I'm just going to say pick to learn hello world ping and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to github desktop then I'm going to check in this file which is basically move change from high to pick to learn and i'm going to commit it and what's going to happen is once this change is detected by docker it's going to automatically push in an image this way continuous integration is going to be satisfied so let's take a look at docker hub let's go back to docker hub let's make sure that this has got the change we were talking about so it says 16 seconds to go and it so let's wait for it to detect it now as you can see it is building this image so this is just to let you know that it's very easy to integrate git and docker and uh, continuous integration is something which is provided by docker by default as of right now it is free i think if you have a paid version it's going to be more useful for corporate reasons or even if you're starting a startup company do definitely check it out so eventually this file will be built and i will let you take a look at it once it's done so let's go over to the summary so as a part of the summary we learned how we could integrate docker hub with github we also learned that docker hub can be used as a continuous integration server to build images so as you can see this was a very easy me method to build ship and run software i highly recommend checking out an enterprise version or commercial version of it and recommending to your company this also integrates with all the cloud platforms such as amazon and azure so give it a shot thank you for watching and i look forward to seeing you in the future lectures thank you Hello everyone, welcome to use case number four. As a part of this use case, we're going to deploy a war application running on Spring MVC to Tomcat 8.0. So the image is going to look very similar to this. You have infrastructure on the server on the bottom, a host operating system, Docker engine, and then on top of Docker engine sits Tomcat. We're going to download the Tomcat 8.0 image from Docker Hub, and then we're going to deploy a Spring war application Let's go back to Visual Studio Code, drill down on use case number four, 
As you can see, I've checked in the project. You may want to import this project into Eclipse or IntelliJ, preferably Eclipse because this is set up for Eclipse. And you can check out what is being done here as a part of the project. It basically contains a Docker controller, which basically maps to um, a URI, and then it's going to greet you with your uh, with a name and a title. You also have the web apps folder, pretty standard Maven project here with Spring Servlet running. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try to deploy this application. We already have the VOD which is generated. There is a readme file which gives you a basic idea into what is being done here. The Docker file as always describes the image we're going to generate and the scripts.txt has all the commands you need to run. So let's get started. Let's go into the Docker file. As you can see, the first thing on Docker file is we are trying to download Tomcat 8.5. This could be virtually anything. It could be 9.0 as well, or you could just say latest. And then the maintainer is nothing but the author of the file, which is a temporary um, placeholder just to identify who's written this file. And then what we are doing is we are just copying spring MVC var into this directory here. We are aware that you, Tomcat is usually installed on user local and uh, we're going to copy to the web apps directory. So let's see how this is done. Let's open Visual Studio Code. Open the scripts.txt. Let's copy the first command here and execute it in the PowerShell. All we are doing to do is to build an image from Tomcat 8.5. We created the image. It took about two to three minutes. Let's go ahead and copy the next command. Let's make sure that the image got created correctly. As you can see, the image is created correctly. Sometimes if it says none, that means the image has a problem. So right now the image is working correctly. So let's go to the next command. We're going to run two containers out of this. So the containers are running on port 5555 and 5556. Let's open Chrome. So as you can see, the Tomcat page shows up. If I do slash spring MVC, so I need to get the root name, Docker spring MVC. So as you can see, this says Spring MVC running on Docker. So we're going to try this on 6666 or 5556. So as you can see, both the containers are running fine. So what we're going to go back and do is we're going to go into the shell. So as an example, Let's do A98. So as you can see, that is a web apps directory. And inside web, web apps sits Docker Spring MVC, which is a war file. This war file has been exploded and has been exploded to a directory like this. And that's why we're able to see this on the screen. That said, we've come to the end of the lecture. What we're going to do is we're going to remove the containers and keep it all clean. So the way to do that would be exit out of the container. Just do docker stop, docker ps hyphen a hyphen q. And then it's gonna stop both the containers, remove them. And then you can remove the images. And that's all it is for this lecture. Let's summarize whatever we've learned right now. I'm going to combine the summary of use case three as well because I didn't have a brain overload section in between. So going back to the Docker file, we use the copy command. It copies the directory as is to the desired location inside the container. The CMD command in the Docker file executes or is a command which the container needs to execute when it starts up. Add basically refers to adding a directory to the desired location and run is executing a command inside the container. 
A good example for run would be to run updates on Ubuntu images or Tomcat images. So that's it. We are at the end of use case number four. This was a simple use case just to demonstrate how to uh, deploy a war file on the Tomcat image. A very regular use case for most engineers. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Welcome to use case number five and use case number six. As you may have noted in the quick introduction to Docker in the previous section, we talked about how to host multiple containers each running their own JDKs. So here you go. We have three goals as part of this use case. Goal number one is to create an Ubuntu 16.04 image with Tomcat 7 and JDK 7 and check it into the Docker Hub repository. Goal number two is to create a Ubuntu 16.04 image with Tomcat 8 and JDK 8 and we check it into the Docker Hub repository. Goal number three is to basically run two Spring MVC containers, one running on Tomcat 8 with JDK 8 and the other running on Tomcat 7 with JDK 7. As you may have noticed, this is one of the core examples I had specified during the start of the course. So let's get started. So let's get started with the sample. Open Visual Studio Code, navigate to use case number five. As you can see, there are two directories here, one with Tomcat 7 and JDK 7, and one with Tomcat 8 and JDK 8. So let's go into the first one. I'm just gonna collapse this. Let's open the Docker file for this particular use case. Here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, we're gonna create this from an image of Ubuntu. As you can see, you can also use CentOS. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna install Tomcat 7.x, JDK 1.7 with all the updates, and then we're also gonna install the curl and the vim commands. Now note that the curl and the vim, for example, are not a part of the image of Ubuntu. Docker is gonna house a very restricted version of Ubuntu, restricted in the sense that it's gonna be a minified version of Ubuntu. So that's what number one is, as far as the from is concerned. As you're aware, the maintainer is an optional parameter. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download the latest version of 7.x. So this is a very important step. If you miss this, you will not be able to build the image or else the image will not work. So what I recommend is go to this URL, open up this particular URL in Chrome, 7.0.7.6. I highly recommend that you copy paste this into this section. If you don't do this, you're not gonna get an image. So the env variable basically defines the path parameter in Ubuntu. So it does, the, it does define the path and also defines any variables which you can use within this Docker file. For example, the Tomcat version is used within the Docker file in these locations. So I can define a variable such as this with a specified value and I can use it within the Docker file. The second thing I'm gonna do is to be able to run an update on the operating system and upgrade any security patches. After that, I'm just gonna install some software property commons, which is basically um, required for you to get Java and all the other softwares. It's just gonna be an add-on to the repository. As you can see, the next thing we're gonna do is to install curl and install vim. So some of the viewers had asked me a question about how we can combine these two lines to make it readable. And I'm gonna go over this in this section when we get here. The next thing we're gonna do is to install Oracle, Java, Oracle JDK 7. We're also gonna define the Java home. As you can see, Java is gonna get installed in this location. So we're gonna define this as a part of Java home. The next thing we're gonna do is, as you can see here, we notice two things. One is I've combined several commands into one line. And the way you can do it is you can add a backslash character and then go into the next line. And then whenever you append, you just add ampersand, ampersand, ampersand. So as you can see, all this is saying is run all of these consecutively one by one. So instead of trying to run this as curl and vim separately, I can also do 
ampersand ampersand backslash and then just do it this way all right note that the last line is going to be without the ampersand and the backslash but for now i'm just going to revert it back this is for you to test it so one other thing to notice is we are also accepting the agreement from oracle jdk so this is the way you accept it so keep a note of all of this we learned how to define an environment variable upgrade the operating system update the repository accept the license and also how to use the environment variable on all i'm doing here is basically i'm moving certain files over to um, certain locations these are all unix commands as you can see i'm just removing whatever is there in the web apps directory all right so let's get started let's go into the scripts.txt let's fire up powershell in case of windows if not if you're using mac just fire up the terminal just copy the path to this directory and then we're going to execute the first command The image was built. It took a few minutes to get it built. So let's go and do Docker images. As you can see, the image was built successfully. If it has not been built successfully, it's not going to give you this name. It's going to show up as none. All right. So um, that's basically it for now as far as this particular section. So let's go and see how we can create a repository and check this image in, into the Docker Hub. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to PowerShell. I mean, a Visual Studio Code. Go into Docker login. I'm going to execute this command. I'm going to log in here. I'm also going to go to Docker Hub. Login. create a repository let's call the repository tomcat7 jdk7 and then we'll say tomcat version 7.0. dot whatever 76 if it's 76 with the latest and greatest of jdk 7 the visibility will remain public the moment i try to move it to private it's going to charge me so i'm just going to keep it free so now that we have created it, I'm going to tag this image. So let's go tag it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to say Docker tag Tomcat 7 JDK 7. As you can see, there's no dash here. And then colon latest. The latest comes from the tag. And then I'm just going to copy this as is. It's already tagged. I'm just going to say Docker commit. Sorry, Docker push. So we have finally pushed the image. It took about five minutes. So let's go check out the Docker Hub repository to make sure that the image is in there. Let's go into um, tags. And as you can see, a few seconds ago, this was actually pushed. Let's open the Docker file in Tomcat 8 JDK 8. As you can see, we follow the same instructions, except for 7, it's Tomcat 8. And then except for JDK 1.7, it's JDK 1.8. So we're getting the image from Ubuntu. We've specified an author. Just make sure that this particular URL actually houses that image. Let's go into that URL. So it's 8.5.12 or 8.0.42. So I'm just going to change it to 8.5.12. Again, this is a very important instruction. Please do not forget it. The env again does two things. It specifies the path variable once the container starts up, which I'm going to show you. The second thing is it's also used to declare a variable in Docker file. So as you can see, these three 
are basically derived from here. We are updating the operating system, we are adding the software property commons and the JDK repository. This is a very important instruction. I um, I did not highlight this in the Tomcat 7 JDK 7 um, Docker file, but I am highlighting it here. It says the below instruction is very important. Failing to add this will not allow you to install JDK after the repository has been added. So make sure you install it, install curl and vim, accept the Oracle license, install JDK or Java installer from Oracle, specify an environment variable so that we have JDK 8 showing up there. And then as always, remove all of the uh, files which you're not going to use inside the web apps directory and then move the Tomcat installation to wherever you want to. That said, let's get started with the scripts.txt. I'm going to run the Tomcat 8 image and then build the image. I'm going to copy the path, open PowerShell, clear, change directory to that location. As you can see, the only image right now is Tomcat 7 JDK 7, which we created before. And then we also have Ubuntu image sitting here because we are writing on top of this. So let's copy this. So the image has gotten created. So let's check the image. As you can see, there's a new image here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same process again. I'm going to log in first. I'm going to tag this image. As you can see, the command to tag is specified right here. The current image colon tag. So I'm just going to copy this as is colon latest and then I'm going to create an image called pictolearn tomcat8 dash jdk8 so before I push this image let me go ahead to docker hub and then I will create a repository I'm going to just going to go back to the dashboard just to make sure the names are correct so tomcat8.x, 5.x with JDK8. So I'm just going to keep it public. So here you go. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove all what's before here and just say push. So the image was pushed. It took about five to six minutes to push. So I recommend that you wait patiently. Now let's go into Docker Hub just to make sure that the image got pushed. As you can see, it was pushed two minutes ago. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. So let's open use case number six. As you can see, there's a war file here. And then the first and most important thing to look at here is this particular section. What I'm doing here is basically, I'm actually downloading this image directly from Docker, Docker Hub. So we will go back to Docker Hub and I want to show you and have you experiment with this. So I'm going to go ahead and put in pictolearn tomcat7 jdk7 just to keep it generic. Just going to remove this section here. And then we're going to build an image out of this section. So before that, I want to make sure that I've deleted and removed all of the images which are there in my local. So the second thing is I moved the war file from here to this directory here because this is where we have Tomcat installed. As you can see, if you go back to Tomcat 7's Docker file, we have it installed in this directory, which is slash opt slash Tomcat. So, and then we're going to write it to root.war in the web apps directory, which is the default uh, web location. We're going to set Catalina home. We're going to append the existing path with Catalina home slash bin, which houses all of the startup scripts for Tomcat. We're going to start Tomcat with these parameters. This is going to be very essential for you to look at when you're trying to uh, assign memory parameters. This is a very important statement here. 
we are going to expose 8080 as a port to the container outside so if you wondered whenever we start the container for example if you go back to use case number two for example and then we look at scripts we have this hyphen p equals 7777 colon 80 so where does this 80 come from the 80 comes from the expose so what we are doing here is inherently we are just exposing 8080 to the outside world 8009 this is the AGP connector AJP connector is used for other reasons but for now we're going to use 8080 I'm just keeping the 8009 open as well and then the work directory is Tomcat I'm just going to give you a brief introduction about this and as you can see the first thing I'm going to do is to start Tomcat so the Catalina.sh run will start the Tomcat server and this is with Tomcat 7 and JDK 7 all right so let's get started let's navigate to use case 6 of the directory for use case 6 and then I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code again so the first thing I actually did is to remove Tomcat 7 JDK 7 as you can see this is the image we had uploaded to the Docker Hub I actually executed these two steps and then removed it so for now you just have the following images if you wish you can delete these images as well So there are no more images in the system. So what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to copy this section. As you can see, we are trying to build an image with the name Spring MVC Tomcat 7 JDK 7 dash image. As you can see, we downloaded the image. If I go into Docker images, you see that this is being downloaded from Docker Hub and we built our image on top of this successfully. So one other thing to do would be to go back to Visual Studio Code, go back to your Docker file, comment out this line which has Tomcat 7 JDK 7 and then uncomment the one which has Tomcat 8 JDK 8. Go back to scripts and then run this particular command. So what we are doing here as a part of the Docker file is we are downloading this image as well. So I'm just going to clear this. We download the Tomcat 8 image as well. So if I clear my screen, go back to Docker images, you're going to see two images, one with Tomcat 7, JDK 7, and one with Tomcat 8, JDK 8. So let's spawn two containers right now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy this command onto PowerShell, clear the screen, run the first container, and run the second container. So if you see, there are two containers running. One is running on 5556, and the other one is running on 5555. One is running on Tomcat 8 with JDK 8. The other one is running on Tomcat 7 with JDK 7. So let's go to the browser. I'm just going to do 5555 and 5556. So the 5555 is the one which contains JDK 7 and Tomcat 7. This one contains JDK 8 and Tomcat 8. Look, another quick thing to show you guys would be to log into um, these containers. and then show you how the path variables actually work. So if I do path, sorry, if I do env, you see that Tomcat version, which is coming from the Docker file. You see all of these arguments which are coming from the Docker file, the Catalina home, the permissions which we um, basically gave, and also the memory, memory settings. All of this is coming from the Docker file here, which is the Docker file for the war file. So as you see, the env environment variable is used for not just declaring variables inside the Docker file, but also to set up the path variables. All right. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Let's summarize. 
Congratulations on finishing one of the most complex use cases. As a part of this use case, just to summarize, we've learned how to run multiple containers, each container running its own version of JDK and Tomcat on the same machine using a Spring War application. We also learned how to push our own images to the repository and use those images. A good example for that would be your engineering team in the company could specify a particular version of Ubuntu or Red Hat or CentOS or Fedora which you could use with the designated versions of JDK and Tomcat. And then um, all the development teams can be made to work on top of those. Apart from that, we also learned how to use the env command, which is the command which basically sets the path variable and also can be used as a variable in the Docker file. The expose command, which exposes the ports. The run command, which basically executes whatever command you give it. The work directory command, which basically is where you want to execute all the commands inside of your image and the command parameter or the CMD, which is the entry point or the first command to be executed when the container is started. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Until then, see you. Welcome to use case number seven. This use case is going to focus on how you can mount volumes from within the container to your local hard drive. A good example of this would be, let's say, the running container was generating logs. For example, your war application could generate logs. Let's say you wanted to view the logs without having to log, log in into the container. Or else if you've had multiple containers running on the same machine, what would happen if the container had to die down? You would definitely need a copy of the logs. So let's get into understanding how to mount volumes. Let's open up Visual Studio Code, drill down into use case number seven. As you can see, there is a war file here, a Docker file. If you see the Docker file, this is the image which we generated as a part of use case five and six, which is housed in our Docker Hub. We are copying the Docker war file from this location onto our web apps directory. All of this is basically setting the environment variables in the container. You're exposing two ports. We went through all of this before, so I'm not gonna repeat it. This is the most important instruction of this Docker file, which is it basically states and tells Docker engine that I want to be able to expose this and mount it to a local hard drive. Okay, so the work directory is the directory where all the instruction sets are run. And the command basically says, I'm going to be running Tomcat when the container starts up. So let's take a look at this. Let's open scripts.txt. Let's open PowerShell. Navigate to the use case directory. So I'm just going to do copy path. You'll do the same thing in the Mac. And then I'm going to run this command. The image is successfully built. So let's go back, copy Docker images, make sure the image was built correctly. As you can see, Spring Cat MVC Tomcat 7 JDK 7 volume sample. Now what we're going to do is to run the container. Now before we run the container, let's take a look at the command. The command until here is probably very familiar to you. I'm still going to use hyphen small p just to make it easier and I'm going to say 3333 80 and then what we see is a hyphen v the hyphen v basically maps the logs directory so as you can see I'm mapping a windows directory here some things to note is that I'm not using a backward slash I'm using a forward slash very similar to the unix machine and for macintosh you will still do the same thing and then after a colon I'm actually doing opt tomcat logs so what i'm going to do here is basically i'm going to be able to copy this once again and i'm also going to uh, route the web apps directory as you can see in the docker file we are trying to mount the web apps directory as well so i just wanted to show you live so before we start and execute this command one very important thing to note here is we have a hyphen V and then again a hyphen, hyphen V. These two are the two volumes which you're going to map. And I'm also going to copy this section here into here. So this is the host port and this is the container port. And you can have as many hyphen V's as you want. So before we get started and execute this command, there's one important step to be done. Let me go over that. Since this exercise requires mounting of volumes, go into the Docker daemon, 
Go to the settings of the Docker daemon, click on the shared drives, click on the F drive and select apply. In most cases, in Windows, it would complain. In case of the Mac, it should be just fine. It will complain as follows. It will say firewall detected. So what you will need to do is to go back into Norton security or your antivirus. Go into the settings and you should see a small uh, smart firewall option. Just uncheck this. Set a duration of at least an hour so that you can work on it. Click OK. Close. Close. Check on this option again. Click Apply. Sometimes it will ask you for your Windows user ID and password. So just key in the user ID and password. So we are all set. So just close this. Go back to the Visual Studio Code. Make sure that you have these two directories which you've specified, which you're going to specify as host mounts. In my case, I made sure that there are two directories, one called logs and the other called web apps, exactly at the same directory location as specified in the Docker file, in the scripts file. Make sure this is forward slash in case you're using Windows. And if you're using Mac, it's pretty much the same thing, except that you'll not have a drive name. So let's go into the directory. Logs, there's nothing in here. As far as web apps, this is a very important thing to know. Let's say you're spawning multiple containers which want to use the same WAR file. What you can do is you can create a mount and have all of those containers mount to this drive and pick up the WAR file from here. So what I'm going to do is as you can see, I removed the copy command which I had to copy the WAR file into the web apps directory. I'm just going to drag it and put it in here. And then I'm just going to go back to scripts, copy this particular section here, paste it and run the container. So the container is running right now. Let's go back to the drive. As you can see, this WAR file was exploded. Now let's go take, it the look, take a look at the logs directory. As you can see, the log files are getting generated. These log files are nothing but the log files mounted inside the container. So if you go back and hit the page. Now remember, you need to specify the name of the WAR file. So in this case, it's going to be So that's about it. So you learn two things. One is to be able to mount logs. And the next thing is to be able to mount a directory which has the WAR file which multiple containers can use. Just to quickly summarize, we saw how to mount the logs of the WAR file. One good practice to do this would be to log the files with the container name on it. So if you're using log4j or slf4j, just make sure that you log the host name the container host name will be different all the time. So that way, even if you're mapping it to the same volume, uh, it, the logs won't get garbled and you'd be able to identify which log pertains to which container. And I'm sure you're going to be using rolling file appenders or rotating file appenders as far as gzipping it when the, day, when the day is done and it rolls over to the next day or if the size exceeds a certain value. The next one to be aware of is to be able to mount the WAR file to a directory. This way all containers can refer to that directory. A change in the WAR file there would automatically start refreshing the other containers. In most cases, people don't do that in production, but in the development and QA, I think it is okay to do it. So I'll let you experiment with it. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you. Now let's take a look at use case number eight. We're going to try to see how we can build microservices using Docker Machine and Docker Compose. So the goal of this use case would be to cover or introduce you to something called Docker Machine, Docker Compose, and then using Docker Machine with Docker Compose for microservices. Now let's take a look at what a Docker Machine is. 
Docker machine is a tool that lets you install Docker engine on virtual hosts. So basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be running virtual uh, machines on your uh, current computer, be it the PC or the Mac, and then you will have Docker engine installed within those machines. So the pictorially you can represent this by whatever you see on the slide. Um, on the left hand side you basically have the regular stack where you have the REST API, the client and the client Docker machine and then you basically create a virtual machine. So uh, it may sound a little abstract right now, but then I think as we go on through the lectures, you will have a better understanding. The picture below depicts the use of virtual machines. So imagine running Docker engines on virtual machines inside your current host PC so or Mac. So that's basically what Docker machine is. So what we're going to do as a part of this exercise is, as you can see, we have the infrastructure and the server on the bottom, the host operating system, and on top of the host operating system, we have the Docker engine. So we're going to use some of the commands of the Docker machine to be able to um, create two virtual hosts. As you can see, there are virtual host one and virtual host two, each having their own memory, own CPU cycles, and uh, IP addresses. As you can see, I've installed two containers um, each one is a microservice. Container 1 runs MySQL, container 2 runs Java. And the same way, the second host runs MySQL on container 1 and Java on container 2. So let's go take a look at how we can do this. Let's go into virtualbox.org. That's the first step when we start Docker Machine on the Mac. Download the latest VirtualBox for your operating system. Once it's downloaded, let's open it. Double click on it so that it can install. Now that we have the virtual box installed, I just opened Visual Studio Code, navigated to use case number 8 and we are looking at scripts.txt right now. This particular section which starts with Docker Machine unto Docker Machine Remove is all that you need to have to learn and understand Docker Machine. So let's go to the terminals. I'm just going to keep this on the side. So what I'm going to do right now is I have two terminals sitting side by side and we're going to create two virtual machines. So I'm just going to copy this command which is here, paste it here and then paste the same thing here but change this VM1 to VM2. So essentially what we are doing is we are saying we want to be able to create a virtual machine with virtual box as the driver and the disk size to be used for this virtual machine is around 20 um, 20 gigs. All right. So the same with this one. Apparently, I think it's two gigs. So we're going to create two virtual machines, two gigs each, one called Hyper-V VM1 and the other one called Hyper-V VM2. So let's see what happens. I'm just going to click on this one here and this one here. Now what we see here on the screen is the virtual machines have been created. As you can see, it says creating machine. It was able to create a virtual machine create an SSH key, started the virtual machine and it's waiting for an IP. And once you see Docker is up and running, what is happening right now is there was a virtual machine created, Docker engine was installed on this machine and Docker is running on that virtual machine. Now that said, uh, we're gonna see how we can use the virtual machines. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close this particular terminal now that we've built both. And um, we're gonna go back to Visual Studio Code. I'm just gonna enlarge this particular window here just to make sure that it's easy for you to understand what I'm doing and uh, I'm going to have this particular section also close by um, so that we can compare things parallelly or maybe I'll minimize it. So what's going on here is let's do docker hyphen machine ls. This command is going to give you all the hyper, hyper v or virtual machines running on the PC. 
I just named this Hyper-V to keep it consistent with Windows. This can be named anything. So whatever name you give here, make sure that you can customize it or uh, give a name of your choice. So as you can see on this section, this basically talks a lot about the attributes or the metadata of the virtual machine. It talks about the driver which was, which was used to install it. It, was, it talks about what is active and what is not. It gives you the state of the virtual machine, the IP addresses assigned to the virtual machine, and the Docker engine running on those virtual machines. Okay, so if you want to try out or just just getting the IP of a particular virtual machine, just do Docker machine IP hyper v dash vm dash one or hyper v dash vm dash two. So each of these have their own IP addresses. So this is something for you to note. So if you go back to Visual Studio Code, I have just covered this particular section here and also trying to enlist all the Docker machines. Now you can also stop and start the Hyper-V uh, or the virtual machines using these commands. It basically says stop and then start in case you want to stop and start the virtual machines. So now let's see how we can use these virtual machines. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this command. If you can see, this is similar to the command which is there on here. This says Docker machine env Hyper-V VM1. And if I copy this command, all I'm going to say is to the Docker engine is I want to be able to use this virtual machine. So once you execute this particular command, you're going to get some of the metadata information of the virtual machine. And also it says run this command to configure your shell. So just copy this, paste it and run it. So now you can do Docker images. There are no images here. Let me clear the screen. And then what I'm going to do is uh, just to get you up to speed with the Docker machine, I'm just going to say docker run hyphen itd hyphen p. 5555 colon 80 and nginx colon latest. So it's going to download the version of nginx which is there in Docker Hub. I can also give it a name called my nginx on Hyper-V VM1. And then what it's going to do is it's going to download uh, nginx from the repository. As you can see, Nginx got downloaded and uh, we're gonna to try to hit the server. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna say docker-machine ls and then I'm just gonna get the IP address. As you can see, this is active right now. And this got active when we ran the eval command. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the browser and paste this one right here. And as you can see, Nginx got loaded correctly. So Nginx is running inside this virtual machine, which is Hyper-V VM1. If I go into 100, it's not gonna work because Nginx was installed in the other VM. So what I'm gonna do as an experiment is, let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's copy this command to make this active. So this is called the env command. Executing this is gonna give you a command which you need to run to log into that virtual machine. So just copy this, paste it, and then run it. And then if you see there are no images here, because the nginx which we installed was on the previous virtual machine so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to go back and then install my nginx hyper v vm2 and if you see it start it's going to start downloading it again As you can see, the Nginx instance was installed and we're just gonna do Docker images. And this is specific to VM2. Uh, so if I go back or just do Docker machine IP Hyper-V VM2, you're gonna see the IP address. I'm just gonna change it here. Well, it's actually here. Click on it. And then despite changing the address, Nginx is running on both the containers. So this is just a sneak peek of creating virtual machines on the Mac using VirtualBox and Docker Machine. I hope you enjoyed the course. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. You can skip the lectures which actually say Windows only and then go on to the Mac one. Thank you for watching. Docker Machine is installed by default with your software when you install it on the Mac and on the Windows. So if you go into docs.docker.com you should see all of the documentation regarding all of the Docker products. 
But in specific, if you want to look for machine, I go, would like you to go into Docker, docs.docker.com forward slash machine, and in specific, the install machine. So if you don't have it installed on Mac OS and, OS and Windows, I recommend following this instruction set. Again, this should be installed by default if you're using the version in the lecture. The other way to check it up would be to go into PowerShell and then just do Docker machine version. And then you should see the version of Docker machine which is installed with the operating system. There are a few prerequisites to installing it on the Windows. For the Mac, I think you already have VirtualBox installed by default. If not, you will need to install VirtualBox and it's pretty straightforward. But on the Windows, it is not that straightforward. So let's go take a look at how it is done on Windows. The first thing to do would be to go into Cortana search and look for turn Windows features on or off. Just make sure that you have containers and Hyper-V checked on. In case one of these is not checked on, I recommend that you click on this to check it on. This would require restarting your PC. So make sure you restart your PC after clicking on OK. The next thing to do would be to click on the search again and look for Hyper-V Manager. Go into the Hyper-V Manager. You should see a section which says Virtual Switch Manager. You will need to create a new virtual switch. And the way you can do that would be to do this. So as you can see, we have something which is internal already, which is used by the default Docker containers. You can create a new virtual switch by making it external and clicking on Create Virtual Switch. Just one thing to note here would be to link it to your wireless router in case you're using the internet via the wireless. Or if you're using the ethernet connection, you can choose one of those uh, network cards. So I'm just gonna choose Intel Centrino Advanced N6205. I'm gonna call this VS-1. And then I'm gonna put in a note saying Docker machine default virtual switch. And then I'm gonna click on apply. It's gonna state if pending changes may disrupt network connectivity, just click on yes. It is actually a good practice to restart your system after doing this. In some cases, you wouldn't need to restart, but I highly recommend restarting so that it can clear out the route tables. So just click on okay, restart your machine, and then we'll get back after the restart. After you restart your machine, go to use case number eight. Use case number eight basically has a project called Docker Compose MySQL. It consists of two projects. One is Ubuntu JDK 8, which is basically nothing but installing JDK 8 on Ubuntu, and I'll tell you why. And then it also has a Java project, and we'll go over this as well. But basically the goal of this exercise is to work on the Docker machine. So click on scripts.txt. So anything which says Docker machine, uh, that's where you are associated to. Now note that this is gonna be for the Windows and the Mac. So I have specified instructions on how to check this up on the Windows and on the Mac. The most important thing here is to be able to run PowerShell as an administrator. So click on the PowerShell, right click on the PowerShell and then say run as administrator. And then go back to the use case, the path of the use case in Visual Studio Code just to keep it all consistent. Just say copy path. So what I'm gonna do is as I said, the first thing to check out is the version of Docker machine. If you're not, if you're having issues with the Docker machine, I highly recommend including the version number and the build. The second thing we're gonna do is, as always, go back to the scripts.txt. And for Windows users, just copy this section and then paste it. As you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm creating a Docker machine with Hyper-V as the virtualization technology. And then I'm also assigning a virtual switch we created called VS1. So the VS1, the name is case sensitive and it comes from the Hyper-V manager. 
So if you go into virtual switch manager, you will see VS dash one. Just make sure that this is case sensitive. So the first Docker machine got created. Now I'm going to create the second Docker machine. So in order to do that, go back to Visual Studio Code and then go back to this particular section, which says Windows, if you're using Windows or if you're using the Mac, just say Mac. Now let's enlist all of the machines we've created. It took a while to create each machine, so be, please be patient. So the command to do that would be docker machine ls. As you can see, it enlists the name of the two virtual machines. I will get into this particular column a little later. It talks about the driverware which was used to create it. Now understand that virtual box is also another driver. So we started Hyper-VM1, and I just wanted to show you I've actually purposely stopped hyper vm2 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say docker machine start hyper v vm2 and what it's going to do is it's going to create a new ip host and the command to do this would be docker machine start and then the name of the virtual machine and docker machine stop and the name of the virtual machine Now the Hyper-V VM machine 2 has also started. So if you look at Docker machine LS, you're going to see both the Hyper-V Hyper machines. Each of them have an IP address, as you can see, 189 and 187. So when I stopped it, this particular virtual machine was active. And let me get into it a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to run both the virtual machines and uh, we're going to host some containers in it and then we're going to see the difference. So what I recommend doing is if you go into the next uh, section of this, you will see that you will be able to execute this command alone to get the IP addresses of both the virtual machines in case you need to use it for scripting. We also talked about the stopping and the starting of the Hyper-V virtual machines. So I'm not gonna cover that once again. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the virtual machine one active. And the way to do it is you will execute Docker machine ENV in the name of the virtual machine. And what I recommend doing is copying this as is, and if you've installed it in the de default location, um, execute that. It's gonna be the same instruction on the Mac. So the moment you run this, you're gonna see a script pop up on the end. So execute that script. And this script is gonna make the first machine active. So as you can see, Hyper-V VM1 is active right now. So if you see Docker images, there are no images well, that is an Nginx install because I installed it first, but you can basically run the Nginx image. I'm just gonna use hyphen P. And as you can see, it created a 
running host. Now there are two running hosts, 32771 and 32769. This one was created by me as a part of my experiments. And then this one is a new uh, host. So the goal here is if I hit these ports directly, it's not gonna work. So localhost colon 32769 is not gonna work. So is the case with 32771. So what I will need to do is, I will need to provide it an IP address because it's running inside the virtual machine. So in this case, the IP address is 10.0.0.187. So I'm just gonna do this and then replicate this and then execute this as well. So as you can see, there are two Nginx containers running on the same um, virtual machine. So as we go into the picture, uh, we look, take, took a look at the microservices picture during the start of this uh, section. And if you see that, I was hoping to start up one Java container and one MySQL container. So in this case, the example basically illustrates running two containers on the second one, uh, on the first one. So if I want to run the same thing on the second one, I'm just going to do Docker machine env hyper v vm2. And then I'm just going to execute this as is. Now note that Hyper-V VM2 should be in the started state or it should be in the running state. And if I go into Docker machine LS right now, as you can see, the second one here is active. So if I look at Docker images, you see that there is one Nginx version. If you can see, there's something which exited a few minutes ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say docker start 485, which is basically the name of the, the container ID. And then it says it's unable to use the certificate. So what I'm going to do is, so well, it actually got started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this particular machine name. So which is the same IP address, well, a different IP address, but the last digit is 189. And then I'm going to do 32769. So this is how Docker machines work. So long story short, they're basically virtual machines running inside the host machine and you can host microservices inside of it. So the next lecture series is going to cover using Docker Compose along with Docker machine. So let's go take a look at that. I hope you have a good understanding of Docker machine right now. So in short, just to summarize, we covered how to use the, how to create the virtual machines which is a prerequisite for Windows, but for, uh, for, for the Mac, you just use VirtualBox. You can find out how to obtain the IPs of the virtual machines. You can list the virtual machines using the following command. You will be able to make one of the machines active and then install images on top of it. Uh, if you execute this, you will get something similar to this if you've used the default installation. And then you can also start and stop these machines. If you want to remove a machine, again, this is a very good thing to be uh, aware of. What I recommend doing is you need to stop the machine and then you can use remove hyphen force or you can go into the Hyper-V manager and basically right click on this machine and then say turn off or shut down and then you can use uh, the rm hyphen f command to remove the machine altogether from your system. All right, so that's basically a high level summary of whatever we discussed right now. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Now that we have uh, some understanding of Docker machine, let's take a look at uh, the Docker Compose. So the use case number eight actually has uh, something called Docker Compose MySQL. It basically consists of a Java project and then Ubuntu JDK 8 image. Uh, this is a very basic image of Ubuntu with JDK 8. So what we are gonna do as a part of this exercise is to go back to PowerShell. Remember to run it as an administrator. So if you've not run it as an administrator, it's gonna give you issues. So run it as an administrator. As you can see, it says administrator Windows PowerShell. So what I recommend doing is go into the use case number eight. And we'll go over this once again. Um, for sake of brevity, I'm just giving you, I'm just taking you to um, get this started as soon as possible. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say Docker machine LS. Make sure that the Docker daemon is running. And if you do Docker machine LS, both of the containers are running right now. So what we're gonna do is we are going to install a Java container and also a MySQL container as we initially stated in the introduction. I recommend going back to that presentation if you have questions. So what I'm gonna do right now is 
I'm going to just say Docker machine eval hyper v dash vm dash one. So what I'm basically going to do is I'm basically going to start up um, Docker machine. So uh, let me go back to this script start text and then uh, env. So as you can see, um, you'd have to use one of the machines as an active machine. So I'm just gonna copy this, make sure that that is the active machine. So if I go back to Docker machine LS, it's gonna specify that the machine is active. So whatever I run inside this is gonna be confined to that machine. So as you can see, we just have an Nginx container. So what I recommend doing is, um, first to build this image, the image of Ubuntu JDK 8. So that's, I'm, I'm gonna use the basic Docker commands to build it. So, and then I'm just gonna go into that directory right now. As you can see, there's a Docker file. And then I'm just gonna say docker build hyphen T. And I'm gonna use the same name, which I've used in the Docker file here, which is picto learn Ubuntu JDK, which is actually pulled them from my directory. So what I'm gonna do is docker build hyphen T. Um, I'm just gonna name the same thing, Ubuntu hyphen JDK 8, and then build it. And I'm just going to say dot. So this is going to build Ubuntu. So the image has been created. I did a tag and also push into the repository. So if I go to DockerHub.com, I basically was able to push it into Ubuntu dash JDK eight. So um, I'm hoping that you can use the same image, or you will need to change this image based on your repository account. Now that said, I'm gonna go back to Visual Studio Code. And if you look at this, we have this project, so we are done with it. So I'm gonna just collapse it. So if you look at this, there are two sections. One is a Java project called Docker MySQL Connector. The other one is a Docker Compose .yaml. Now Docker Compose is used to create microservices or run services inside of Docker machines or hosts or existing hosts. It provides an easy to read format. Uh, if you don't know YAML, I highly recommend looking up YAML. YAML is spelled as Y-A-M-L. And um, it's a human readable markup language. So I uh, recommend reading that. If you go in here, you will, say, uh, you will see what it is. So that said, um, this Docker Compose file is in YAML. First, we declare the version of Docker Compose we are gonna use. So in this case, 3.1 is the latest. The second one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, as I showed up in the, I showed in the first lecture, we're gonna create two services. One, which is gonna be a MySQL service, and the other one is gonna be a web service. I call it a web service because uh, it's a standalone Java project. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open Eclipse, and then say import, and then existing Maven projects. Make sure you click on existing Maven projects here and then click on next, go to browse, or you can just paste in the, uh, the path to the project and then you click on browse and then you click on finish. For those of you who know Maven, I'm just gonna go over the palm.xml file. So the palm.xml is very straightforward. It basically uses one dependency, which is the MySQL connector and everything else remains the same. There's also an assembly plugin to run the jar file as an executable. Now I highly recommend becoming aware of this. The next thing in the Docker file is basically, we, we, we basically say I want to get the Ubuntu slash JDK 8 image. If you're using your own image, I highly recommend that you have to change this. This is a very important step, but I'm gonna keep this up to date. The maintainer, as you know, is nothing but the author. And then what I'm doing here is exactly the same as what we did in the previous use cases. I'm just moving this project as is and then running Maven assembly. So the Ubuntu JDK 8 also has the Maven plugin installed. So as you can see, it's just gonna execute this Java file, which is called the MySQL connection. All this Java file does is it is going to sleep for 10 seconds and it's gonna to try to see if it can connect to the MySQL database. So, um, that's basically what we do here. Now going back to the Docker Compose file, as you can see, we are we just name our microservice. It's called, the first microservice is called database. The next one is called web. So the web is nothing but the standalone application. We create, um, the we use the Docker file, which is there inside of 
Docker MySQL connector. So if you want to see it, it's inside the Docker MySQL connector. So we use that and then give it a host name of web. Uh, I will cover this later. The TTY is the same as the TTY we use when we use the Docker build command, we use a dash T and it's the same as that. The depends on basically says that I want to start up the service after this service has been started up. So imagine a use case where the standalone application starts up before the database is actually up. So we want to be able to avoid that. So in order to do that, we give, basically give depends on and then we also link it to the database. So this is basically going to create a link between here and here and I will get to it in a little bit. This is a very important statement. The environment specifies the environment variables. So this Docker Compose file is documented very well. Now let's take a look at links. So links basically is, um, so if you look at the MySQL connection, if you see here, I'm basically specifying db colon 3306. Now this db is basically nothing but the links which you create. Okay, and the 3306 is the port which you expose. Now remember, 3306 is a port. So this is as good as the expose command in the Docker file. And the host name is MySQL. And then we give it the environment variables, the username and password. So just to take you back to that picture, we're gonna go back to that picture which I, uh, which is the use case picture, which is gonna give you a clear description. As you can see, we created two Docker machines with two different IP addresses. These are dummy IP addresses. One has a microservice running, which is called MySQL, and another is a Java container, a standalone Java program called web. This is called DB in our Docker Compose file, and this is called web in our Docker Compose file. Um, um, so the Java is basically the web, and MySQL is basically the database, and the same is the case in this case as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a Java program run uh, in this section, which is gonna connect to the MySQL, and the same thing is gonna happen here as well. So just to quickly review the Docker Compose file once again. So going back to the Docker Compose file, uh, just to recap, this is the version, this is the latest version. We specify two microservices running on each machine. One is called the DB and the other one is called the web and the web is a standalone. The image is name of the image. In this case, the image which has to be downloaded from the Docker Hub repository. This is the same as the expose command so, so that we can have um, anything from the host machine access this. And also this particular micro container access this. And then since we are running both of them under the same container, this is gonna use port 3306, which is the highlighted one in this case. This is for any host to connect to the container inside. And the host name is nothing but the host name. I mean, it's very self explicable. Um, the TTY is in this case, we specify TTY which says uh, run it in TTY mode. The depends on basically says once this is started, only then this needs to be started. And then links basically specifies the name of the, the service this can connect to. So the place where we are using it is we are saying db colon 3306 instead of localhost colon 3306. And Docker will automatically try to resolve this because this is a host name. All right, so, so let's go through this lecture and then see how to work on it. Um, I'm just gonna go through the Docker file quickly. As you said, this is a basic Docker file, self explicable and it's gonna run that MySQL connection. And as you can see, this has got a while loop unless and until it connects, it's not gonna exit out of the while loop. So let's go see how that works. So as you see on the screen right now, we have Docker machines listed out. We have seen that Hyper-V VM1 is active and we've gone into the into the um, use case number eight with Docker My Compose MySQL directory, which houses the Docker Compose.yaml file. And uh, as you can see, it has both the directories and the Docker Compose.yaml file is gonna look into this directory to create the, uh, the Java image. And then uh, it's gonna use the Java image is gonna be built off of the Ubuntu JDK 8, which has the Maven plugin installed and it's gonna download the MySQL image. So let's see how this can be started up. So let's go back to scripts.txt. As you can see, uh, the first command is to do a build. Uh, if you wanna run the containers along with the build, you use this command, which is which is docker compose up hyphen hyphen build hyphen D, which is the detached mode. Uh, you can do this as well. So um, we can do a couple of things. So let's start with Docker Compose build just to get started, but it's not required to just do a build. You can also do a run container right away. 
So let's go into this. Just make sure this is running as administrator. Now this is not a requirement as far as a Mac is concerned. So I'm just going to paste this command. Um, sorry. So copy and then paste. And it's going to start building it. As you can see, it's getting it from Pictou Learn Ubuntu JDK 8. I just copy pasted the subsequent commands. As you can see, I did a Docker Compose PS, which is going to list all the containers which are starting and stopped. Right now, we do not have any. So in order to start the containers, we just do Docker Compose up hyphen D, which is running in detached mode. As you can see, it tried to pull in the MySQL uh, image from the Docker Hub, and it created the web and the, um, the MySQL image, the Java image. So the Java image is called, goes by the name web, and then the MySQL image goes by the name DB. So if you go to the, um, I'm just gonna clear. Uh, if you just go back to Docker Compose logs web, as you can see, the connection was successful here. Again, you can tail. So what this is saying is this is going back to the Java program, and then it's basically saying that it was able to connect. So it got out of the while loop. So that's what this means. Um, so in order to run this again, as you can see, Docker hyphen compose ps is going to give you two containers which are running so one has exited because it connected and this has got to do with the Java program we wrote up and the other one is still up now something interesting I want to show you is I want to give a docker compose IP hyper V dash VM dash one so what I'm going to do here is docker machine sorry so when I do this, I'm going to get the IP address of this machine. So what I can do also is to use the MySQL client to connect, to be able to connect to this machine directly on port 3306. Now this has been specified by the the, um, the Docker Compose file by exposing 3306. So I'm just going to open it here and then I'm just going to create a new connection. I'm just going to specify the host name as 187.3306 and the password as root. And then I'm going to first test this connection. I'm just going to specify users as the default schema. If you test this connection, it says it was able to connect it. So what actually happened is the host machine is trying to connect to the, the virtual machine right now. And it's specifically connecting to port number 3306 on the virtual machine. So this is something which I wanted to show you as well. So um, the other thing to do here is if you want to bring down the containers, you can just say docker-compose down which is also enlisted in the scripts.txt. So uh, you might want to go over it. So logs will basically give you the logs. Logs-ft is nothing but tailing the logs. Uh, we already went through it. I basically repeated this command here. So I'm just going to remove it. Um, and then you can also log into the bash shell uh, if you do a docker compose run. So instead of exec, which we use in the Docker commands, we will use docker compose run. So if you see here, docker compose ps, it's basically removed all of the required containers. So if I want to just build um, a specific container, I can specify build web, and it's just going to build the web module. If I want to specify, if I want to specify the DB module, I just specify DB. So if there are changes to the Java code. Remember that you can use the build command. So I haven't documented it here. I will put in some notes, but basically I'm using this particular command here if you want to build in a specific image. So build a specific image can be done using this command. So if you, let's say you're making changes to the Java code here, uh, you can basically use the docker compose build command with uh, the desired service name. And then you can also, if you want, if you wish, you can just do docker compose hyphen D and then once it starts up, just quickly go into logs ft web, and you should see that it's going to start tailing the logs. It's not connected yet. As you can see, it's going to start connecting. As you see, the MySQL connection was successful. And the reason why this is happening is because of the fact that in the Docker Compose file, we have specified the the depends, which means that after it starts this, you're asking the instruction to start this particular container. So that's basically what's happening here. Um, so that's something to keep a note of. 
Other than that, I think you, pretty much all the commands here are pretty basic. Uh, you can actually stop a service with just docker hyphen compose stop. So, so you can just say docker hyphen compose stop web, and then it's going to stop the web. And you can again say start web, and it's going to start the web container. So this is as easy as starting and stopping. Now, if you remember the 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 diagram I showed you in the PowerPoint. It's basically everything is a microservice. The web is a microservice. The database is a microservice. And the microservices are listed as services in Docker Compose. And as you see, it's very easy to create images, very easy to watch the logs. You can swap the images. You can do a bunch of things with this. As this is an introductory course, this is just a simple use case to give you access to what is in. So the reason why I tried to print the environment variables inside the container is this is mentioned as an environment variable. So if you go into the uh, Java code, as you can see, I'm printing all the environment variables assigned as a part of the Docker file. So in this case, I've assigned one, two, three, four, five, six, just to demonstrate this, and it is printing that. So the other thing to note is the DB. So this is using DB as the host name to connect. And the reason why that's happening is because of the links. Now, if I specify DB colon MySQL1, I basically have to change this to MySQL DB colon My, and you can specify MySQL1, or you can specify DB. So I'm just going to, I like to keep it simple and easy. And uh, so I'm just going to leave it at DB. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. This is a basic introduction for you to get an understanding to Docker Compose. Just remember that this is specific to the Docker machine. So what I mean by that is if we go do Docker machine PS, um, sorry, LS, you will see that this particular image was installed only on this one right here. In case you want to install it on Hyper VM2, you will have to do Docker hyphen Docker hyphen machine, and then you have to specify env Hyper V dash VM dash two, and then you will need to copy the last command and paste it and run it so that Hyper VM2 is active, and then you just have to do Docker hyphen compose up hyphen up. Uh, and then you can just say build hyphen D. Okay, so you can either do this and it's basically going to, sorry, you know, it says that service built, I got the command wrong. So the best thing is to use it, use this particular section. So you see up dash dash build dash D. So let's try that. And it's going to build the image and it's going to run the container. So as you can see, it's pulling the image into Docker machine C, no, Docker uh, Hyper-V uh, VM2, and it is trying to, um, build the database image right now and it is going to start the java image as well so as you can see it's running it's creating the containers it's going to take a while as you can see the downloading of images and assembling of maven is the most time consuming section as a part of this exercise so you will need to be a little patient to understand this better but once you ship up ship an image anybody in qa anybody in production can download this image and just execute it as is you just have to do docker compose up and it will spawn it on whatever virtual host so the image is ready and then i'm just going to do docker compose logs hyphen ft web and as you can see on machine two, it is going to tail the logs and it has a bunch of other, uh, as you can see, it's connecting to JDBC MySQL database 3306 was a failure. So why did that happen? Um, so maybe I just replaced the forward slash with one slash as you can see there's an error here and it's still trying to connect to the database so the moment you replace it with a forward slash you should be good so what i'm going to do is i'm going to kill this process i'm just going to say docker hyphen compose stop web and then i'm going to make this change in the java code and then i'm going to say docker hyphen compose build web And it's just building the web project right now. It's rebuilding the web project right now. This way you can make changes to the microservices and deploy only those microservices. So the reason why uh, I forgot the forward slash is just to demonstrate to you that you can just build a specific image of one of the services and then have it deployed to any um, environment in production or QA or UAT. 
So we're waiting for this particular task to complete right now. And then I'm going to start up the container again. So I'm just going to say docker hyphen compose up hyphen D web. And it's going to start. I'm just going to say docker compose logs hyphen FT web. So it's going to hopefully correct connect to the right destination. As you can see, the connection was successful. So you can use this command to connect to or bring up a specific image. So uh, that's basically what it is. I hope you had a good time listening to this lecture and find it interesting. I would still recommend that you take a look at all of these commands. Now, all of these commands specified in scripts.txt are very important. I'm just going to add in docker compose up hyphen D and then you can also specify the service name in case you know which service name you want to do it or you want to deploy. Now you can also remove all of these containers uh, even though part not a part of this exercise. I, if you do docker compose down it's going to remove all of the containers which are running. So all right so if I do docker compose ps you're not going to see anything at all in the in the dictionary. All right. So I hope you had a good lecture. I look forward to assisting you as far as these use cases are concerned, either through the forums, but do definitely take a look at it and let me know if you have any questions. I will try to summarize all of this in the next lecture. Let us run through a quick summary of this use case. Uh, Docker machine and Docker compose are the two components you learned. As far as Docker machine, we learned how to start and stop machines and also to find the IP address of machines and also activating a machine and deploying images and containers on it. As far as Docker Compose, we learned how to build an image, run an image, build and run an image, stop and start a container, tail logs, and build just one microservice and run a container with that microservice if something had to change. Now, I highly recommend that you go through each and every bullet here and practice this use case a few times to get a better understanding or else it may sound a little hard. As always, I'm here to assist and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thank you. Welcome to use case number nine. As a part of this use case, we will try to create a RESTful microservice with Spring Boot and Hibernate. They will interact with a MySQL database. As you can see, container one runs MySQL and container 2 is a web container running Spring Boot and Hibernate. We will use a RESTful client such as Postman or curl to make the RESTful calls and test a microservice. So let's see how that can be done. Now let's open Visual Studio Code. Let's navigate into use case number 9. As you can see I have use case number 8 open as well. This use case has basically a YAML file and uh, it also has a Java project. So let's go through the YAML file. The YAML file, as you can see, the first version is the version of Docker Compose, as we saw in the previous use cases. We're going to run two microservices, one called MySQL, which is going to download the MySQL image. The next one uh, is ports, which basically says expose this as a port on the host machine. And the host name is basically MySQL. We basically provide the user uh, name and password for the root account. You can basically change it if you're using this in real time. We also have a web microservice, which is called PictoLearn Docker. Runs on port 5555. As you can see, um, it's mapped to port 8080 of the container. And the host name is called web. The TTY is true, very similar to your Docker build command. Now I've commented this out. I recommend that you take care of this or experiment with this particular tag on both the Windows and on the Mac. And if you have questions about volumes, go back to the use case where you um, learn about volumes. So this is a to-do for this class. It depends on MySQL, which means the container is going to start this first and then look at this. And then it's also linked to MySQL, which means that when you run the Java program, you're going to refer this with MySQL as the host name. And remember, this can also have an alias name called my-sql or something like that, which is easy to read. And either ways, I'm not giving the alias, but if you give the alias, you need to basically refer that in the program. And then I basically specify an environment variable, which is not really required. 
So uh, this is just to demonstrate the use of environment. So uh, that said, let's import this particular project to uh, Java. Before that, I also want to show you, uh, open the PictoLearn Docker and show you the Docker file. The Docker file is very simple. It basically gets an image from PictoLearn Ubuntu JDK 8. If you're wondering where you got this image from, go to use case number eight. And then if you look at the Docker file here, it basically running, is running Ubuntu 16.04 with Oracle JDK 8 installed along with Maven. So we're gonna use this image. So if you are experimenting with this, make sure to correct um, this particular Docker file, which is basically gonna get the respective image. Now this image will need to run on any Linux version with JDK 8 and Maven installed. So that's basically uh, the high level. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move this project as is to this particular directory and then run Maven on it. And this is how you start Spring Boot. It's basically Java hyphen jar and then you provide a log path and then you also map that particular version of the jar which Maven's gonna create. So let's take a look at the Java project. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the path to this particular project which is nothing but the Java project. I'm gonna open Eclipse and then I'm gonna say import existing Maven projects. I'm gonna just copy paste this, click on finish. The next thing I'm gonna do is to open it. As you can see, we have the Docker file here. Um, the Eclipse has the Docker plugin installed, so it's looking very legible. Just keep a note of this particular image. As I mentioned earlier, it's got JDK 8 with Ubuntu and Maven installed. And um, add it to the path. And we're adding the whole project to the path and we're running Maven and with Java-Jar. And this is how you start the Spring Boot application. You can as well try it out on the local. Uh, if you don't wanna use Docker Compose, feel free to try this out on local. The only thing is MySQL will not be started. So that's the only deficiency here. Other than that, it also has a scripts folder. And the scripts folder basically um, talks about JSON. So just open with text editor. And then as you can see, this is how the JSON is gonna look like. It's gonna have a name and uh, an email, possibly an ID as well. And then um, this is an example of the curl command in case you need to use uh, if you're using Mac. And um, it also has the SQL file, which basically gets generated, but you, you really don't need to do this. We're just gonna create a table called users, and then with the name and an email and an ID, which is the primary key. That's the goal of this microservice, to be able to create a user table. And um, so let's take a look at uh, some of the things in Spring Boot. So as you can see, the first and prime Java class, which is going to get executed as a part of this Java file, is going to be application.java. So if you look at the pom.xml, I've included the versions of Spring Boot and MySQL. So this particular series is just going to be a quick overview of what we are including in the Maven project. So as you can see, I basically have Spring Boot Maven plugin, which is very important for you to run Spring applications. And then we also have the mysql.jar. We have all of the packages required for Spring Boot to function. I'm using release 1.4.1 release, but if you have a later version, uh, feel free to use that. We're also using JDK 1.8, as you can see. And then, so going back to the first class, this is basically the first class which gets executed. And as you can see, this is using JDK 8 Lambda functions. And uh, we're gonna go to controller. Now this is the RESTful controller. As you can see, there is a delete method. You can delete it using an ID. You can list all of the users. We can add users. So it's basically got all the CRUD operations. So creating, deleting, and listing for now. This basically has user DAO, which is auto-wired. So what we're gonna do as a part of this DAO is it's just going to create a session factory. For those of you who don't know Hibernate, you should experiment with this simple class just to get an understanding of Hibernate. Now, um, a lot of people use IBATIS or other ORM tools, but this is just a, a example for you to learn from. 
So as you can see, the user DAO actually has a get all method, which is going to query the database for all the users. The, there's also one other method called get by email. I've just added it in case you want to uh, expand this RESTful controller. And then there's a get by ID and there's also an update. And there's also a save method. So I'm just going to put annotations in here uh, when I check in uh, the, the particular series to Git for better understanding. And then we have the user object, which is nothing but the ID, email, and the name. As you can see, it's got some limitations on what you can enter. So just be aware of this particular limitation. The minimum is two, maximum is 80. And then um, we have a database configuration, which is going to take in the username and password. So it reads all of these parameters from application.properties, which is in source main resources. As you can see, we have an app name, app description, path to the logs, and then we also have a driver for MySQL. We plug in the username and password for the root. If you notice here, the host name is MySQL. Now, in case you change the Docker Compose file to have an alias or something like that in case of links, then you will need to um, basically go back and then change this particular host name. There's also log4j2.xml. We're using log4j2. It's going to log to a particular path. So all said and done, we are going to go back and execute this. Since this course pertains to using Docker, I'm, I have not focused much on um, the, the working of these particular aspects, but I'm assuming that since you're all Java engineers, you're going to catch it up. Just note that you can play around with this program after downloading it from Git. The exercise here is to do a add, list, and delete of users from the table. And as you can see, the uh, user is going to look something very similar to this, this. And then here I'm saying create and drop. So what it's going to do is every time this container starts up, it's going to drop the table and create a new table. So you don't need to execute any scripts. Uh, you can basically change this to update or other other possible values for hibernate. But just understand that it's just going to create and drop. All right. So let's go check it out. The next thing I want to show you is also to be able to install a RESTful client if you're not so comfortable using curl. So you can get Postman, which is um, a REST client. So the instruction of this is pretty straightforward. You can also get a plugin if you're using the Chrome browser, or else you can get the complete installable from one of these versions. So I highly recommend this. It's free. It, um, it allows you to test all the RESTful calls with session in case session is turned on as well. So there are other clients which are Insomnia. So you can just say REST client and then you can get Insomnia, which is also a free client. There's one called PAW and PAW basically is um, only available for the Mac, but it's also a RESTful client. Um, these are, this one is particularly, in particular is paid. So I recommend using REST uh, Postman so uh, in case you're not familiar with using curl if you're using curl then good enough so that said i think i've kind of covered all the installation and introductory part on what is required for this use case so in the next lecture you're going to see how this is all going to fit in thank you for watching this lecture and i look forward to seeing you in the next one so right now I'm on the directory of use case number nine. So let's go ahead and see what's in the what's in the directory. I'm going to type in Docker images to see what images I have. So here we see Docker Compose Spring Boot. I'm just going to get into that directory. And then I'm just going to say Docker. So I'm just going to run the scripts file. So the easiest way to learn this to use is to use the scripts file. Um, I highly recommend doing that. So just do docker compose build and it should get all the images. So the image was built. It took a few minutes. Now I'm just going to run the second script, uh, which is to be able to get the image up and running. So in that case, I'm just going to skip and then go to step three. Now I can use any of these commands. Now remember the hyphen D is in running in detached mode. So I'm going to try to use that. I'm going to start both the services, the service for web, uh, from web and also for MySQL. 
So I'm just going to copy paste it right now. And as you can see, it's starting to pull the MySQL image. The web image was actually automatically built. This shouldn't take that long. As you can see, the, the image was built. And then I'm just going to do Docker Compose PS. And then as you can see, both of the containers are running. So just for sake of verification, I'm just going to do logs hyphen FT and then web. This will give me the, the tailing of all the logs. I just want to make sure that everything is started up correctly. And it says starting application. So what I'm going to do right now is to open Postman. And, um, and then I'm going to show you how this can be done in the most elegant manner. So if you open Postman, it's going to give you a user interface to make the RESTful call. So what I'm going to do right now is I actually created this collection just so that I could show it to you quickly. Uh, this is pretty self-intuitive. So what I'm going to do right now is, as you can see, I created a body like this. Now this is the same body you're going to see in the scripts folder inside uh, the pictolearn docker file. So if you look at the post.json it looks very similar and then the only thing here which I've added is basically the ID but you don't really need to give an ID. The header is content type is application slash json. Um, definitely do mention this in the header. So the moment I send this one I'm going to give a get a success. So the way I can verify this is I can go to list all the users and then as you can see this is localhost 5555 because this one's running on 5555. As you can see the web container is running on 5555. So I'm just going to click list and then it's going to give me. So let's say I add another user. So let's me go to body. I'm just going to copy this as udemy2 and then id could be 25 or 3 it doesn't matter because uh, MySQL is going to give you another ID and then I'm going to say XYZ foo 2 send it I received a success I list all the users as you can see I have two users right now now in case I want to verify what's going on I would just click on the MySQL workbench it's the same thing with the Mac so I'm just going to open MySQL and uh, as you can see this is running on port 8888 so I'm just going to edit the current connection and then point to port 8888. Click on test connection. The connection is working. So I'm just going to double click on it to open it. And then I'm just going to select the user table. Double click on it. And then I'm going to say select star from users. As you can see both of these records are inserted into the database. And then if I want to find something out um, I can also use the um, list all users and then if I want to delete a particular user I can just say delete and then say and then it says success so this is coming back from the Java code and if I go back and refresh the database I should see only one record as you can see there's just one record so this is pretty straightforward and um, it's good to know how to run this use case um, so this brings us to the end of the lecture I hope you had a good time understanding the concept of how to run microservices with Spring Boot and uh, Hibernate with uh, MySQL and also a glimpse of the Postman which is the RESTful client. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thank you. Welcome to use case number 10, scaling up with microservices using Docker Compose. I highly recommend going over the previous use cases to get an understanding of where we are. As you can see in the picture, we have a MySQL container running on top of the Docker engine and two web containers. We also have a router and a RESTful client. The RESTful client will make a call to the router and the router will automatically redirect the request to one of the web containers. Now these web containers are elastic. When I say elastic, I mean scalable. As the load increases, you can scale up more containers using Docker Compose 
and they, the, the new web containers can interact with the MySQL container. So the router or the dispatcher as we call it is the basic component which will query the Docker machine for all the hosts with the name web and then correspondingly forward it to one of them once they are up. So let's see how we can develop on this use case. Welcome to the code review section of use case 10. As you can see, I've opened up Visual Studio Code with use case number 10. There is a project by name Docker Compose Spring Boot, which we are going to work out our examples on. If you expand this project, you will see there are two um, sub projects. They basically are Java projects. But the first one is called PictoLearn Dispatcher, which is nothing but the router. And then there's another project called PictoLearn Web, which is nothing but our web container, similar to what we had in the previous use case. No changes. And then we have the Docker Compose and also we have the scripts.txt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up um, scripts.txt and Docker Compose and also the Docker files from each of these projects just to give you an overview. So let's take a look at the Docker Compose.yaml. As you can see, this is using version 3.1, which is currently the latest version. As versions change, the impacts are usually minor. So I'm not going to update the lecture for minor changes. Services defines a set of microservices. We have the first microservice as MySQL. As you can see, we've specified the image to be downloaded as MySQL. And we have specified a port. The 8888 is the port available to the host machine. 3306 is the host available inside the container. Host name is MySQL. We've defined two environment variables just to start up MySQL. The second section talks about the web container or the web microservice. If you look at the web microservice, it's the same as what we had before, except for the fact that we've commented out the port. And the reason we've commented out the port is because when we want to scale up the Docker containers, Docker will automatically allocate a port, as I, I've mentioned here. And then links is used by the code to make a request to MySQL. Dispatcher, on the other hand, is microservice 2. It's a router which will send the request to a specific web container. And then we've specified a port here so that we can connect to the router and make the request. As you're aware, the router is just a, a dispatcher, meaning it will try to see when the web container scale up as to which web container is alive. And then it will make a request to that web container randomly. So this is pretty basic. Um, as I said, it depends. Dispatcher depends on the web service to be up and the web depends on the MySQL service to be up. So that is as far as Docker Compose. The next thing we're going to look at is PictoLearn Web and PictoLearn Dispatcher. What I'm going to do firstly is I'm just going to import them as existing Maven projects. So just go ahead, click next, copy the path. And then you can do the same thing with Pictol on web. And as long as you have the Docker plugin installed in Eclipse, you should be able to view the Docker file. So let's take a look at the Pictol on web. It's pretty much the same as what we had in the previous use case. Uh, note that this uses Ubuntu JDK 8, which we built as a part of use case number eight. And then let's go to Pictol on dispatcher. So no changes as far as PictoLearn Web is concerned. It goes by the same um, same code base as what we saw in use case, in the previous use case, where you have a user controller. It has three RESTful uh, methods. One is delete, list, and add. And it's just going to add a user, list a user, or delete a user based on the user ID. It's using Hibernate, and the Hibernate properties are injected via application.properties. As you can see, I've just changed this to say update in case you have the previous use case running. We don't want to interfere with it. I've just changed it to uh, update. And the second thing to note is the host name here, which is MySQL. And this host name is derived from our Docker Compose.yaml, which is this particular section here. So just keep bear that in mind. Apart from that, everything else looks the same. The model is just a specific user class. It's got an ID, email, and name. So no changes to this particular project, same as the previous one, except that it's going to be named differently from a Maven perspective, wherein we've introduced uh, the name as a 
name as pick to learn hyphen web instead of what you saw in the previous use case. So going to the more specific version of the dispatcher, as you can see, this is the version which we obtained from Tomcat 8 JDK 8 on use case number five. So if you go back to use case number five, you would have seen Tomcat 8 JDK 8. Feel free to play with this. It necessarily need not be picked or learn. And then the maintainer is as is. I just installed LSOF to basically find out if, uh, to try to debug if one of the web containers is running within the machine. This setup is basically explaining how I set the Tomcat path. I'm trying to expose 8080 and 8009, which is the AGP connector, the work directory, which you're probably familiar with from the previous lectures. I'm trying to add this particular project as is to this particular path in the container. I'm making a directory for the logs. Um, there is a possibility that the logs may not print because Spring Boot keeps changing the logging framework. Uh, I've tried my best to print the logs in case it does not work. Since Spring Boot is not the criteria for this course, I recommend that you um, try to play around with it. And then I'm just copying the the directory as is and I'm doing maven clean package and then I'm copying the war over from the target directory inside the container to the tomcat directory All right so and then I'm just starting up tomcat plain vanilla docker file the first thing to note in the pictolearn dispatcher project is the web.xml as you can see the web.xml consists of a filter and anything which is going to be called as far as the URL pattern is going to go through this particular filter. So I've just added this filter as a starting point to start debugging to make sure that the requests are coming in. Now that said, let's go take a the, look at the most important section of this project, which is the proxy servlet. The proxy servlet acts just as a reverse proxy. For those of you who have worked on Apache or uh, Nginx, you would know that all of these servers, not just load balance, but also act as a reverse proxy. Now, what I mean by a reverse proxy is whenever you do a GET request or a POST request, the request headers, the cookies, and the body is forwarded to a backend system as is. So as you can see, anything which intercepts or has proxy servlet in the URI is going to get forwarded to the servlet. It's got a do get and a do post method. And all this do get or do post do, which is kind of identical, is it just gets the request headers and passes it on to a backend system. That's the long story short. So I'm just gonna go over the do get piece of it. The do post piece is very similar, just that it's a post request and it's got a um, request body. Uh, and um, all it's gonna do is it's gonna pass it to the backend system as is. Now, the, there are two things to note here. The first thing is I wanna be able to make sure that anything which has proxy servlet has a URI and I need to pass it to the same URI in the PictoLearn web, um, serve, in, in, in the RESTful service. So if you look at user controller, it's got a delete, it's got a list and it's got an add. So when I call this servlet with list, add or delete, this particular servlet should randomly pick up one of the web containers and invoke those particular URLs. So uh, long story short, just to exemplify this in a better manner, if you see in the past use cases, we had list users, add user and delete user. One thing which is common among these three is if you see the host name here, it says slash list, slash add and slash delete. So when we are gonna go through a dispatcher, we're gonna use the Docker machine name on which this is gonna run. The port is 1111, which comes in from the Docker file of Docker Compose YAML. For dispatcher, it's 1111. So remember, we're gonna call the dispatcher and not the web container directly. And then you have the context name, uh, which is pictolearn dispatcher, which basically comes in from this particular value. Or if you look at the palm.xml, I actually give it a final name of pictolearn dash dispatcher, as you can see here um, in this particular section. And then what this is gonna do is when you call, for example, add, it's just gonna say slash add. So what I'm gonna do is my goal is to call one of the web containers running since we are gonna be scaling web containers up and down. So I'm just gonna be calling one of these so that this maps to this particular servlet. So all this reverse proxy is doing is it's basically taking the request headers and the body as is and routing to a container which is up and running, all right? So I highly recommend going through this particular source code Two things to remember is whenever the response 
request is made, the headers and the body have to be passed to the backend system. And when the response is made from the backend system, the header and the body should be passed as is to the client without much modification. All right. So for just uh, three things to specify here, one is I get the path. When I say the path, the path basically has to be slash list. So what I do is I get the URI and then negate this one and then this becomes slash add. So this is the this is the URL I have to call if it I have to call the web container directly. So that is this piece of code. If the path is empty, it's going to say invalid get call. It's going to pick up a random IP address. Now this is an important method to look into. The basically what I do is I go and look at or query all the host names which have web as the name. Now this web is coming in from this particular section where the host name is web. As you can see, if we have three containers, web containers running, all of them will have web as the host name and they'll be mapped to different IP addresses inside the Docker machine. And I'm just gonna get one of those IPs randomly and then make a call. So if you go back to the get use case, I get a random IP address. If IP address is null, I return error. If IP address exists, I'm just gonna call 8080, which is the port which Spring Boot runs on by default. And then I'm just gonna use the Java Net APIs to make a get call. Now, remember that I'm adding a header on the way back in the response. And once I get back the response, I process the response and send it back to the client as is. So this is a high level overview of the proxy servlet. Again, this is not a Java course. I highly recommend going through this particular router. It's, it's not rocket science, it's just a reverse proxy and all it does is pass request headers and body as is in case of a post and request headers as is in case of a get to a backend system, gets the response back and passes it on to the client as is. Just that it picks up a random port. And the goal here is to let you know that when you scale, you will need to devise something like this, which can pick up a random port. Typically it's done in Golang or using Nginx or Nginx with Lua or Apache or with sub requests or some kind of modules which can give you the IP address. So you'll have to do some kind of scripting. Uh, the, Docker, the Docker con, they showed this with Golang, but I did it with Java. So the choice is up to you on how you wanna do this router. So let's go take a look at a working sample. So welcome to the coding section of this lecture. The first thing to make sure is that the Docker daemon is running on your taskbar if you're using Windows or the Mac. And also to make sure that if you're using Windows, go into the Hyper-V manager, make sure that the Hyper-V Hyper VMs are running, the ones which you created in the previous use case. And then let's go into PowerShell in case of Windows, Terminal in case of the Mac. Let's run PowerShell as an administrator in case you wanna run Docker machine, and then open up scripts.txt on the 10th use case, copy the path, navigate to that directory, and then uh, execute the first command, which is to see what machines are running. As you can see, there are two virtual machines. We're gonna use the first one so the way they use the first one is go back to the uh, scripts folder, execute this command if you're on uh, if you're on Windows, copy the last statement, same as the case for the Mac, execute it, and then go back to the Docker machine ls command, and you should see that the first one is active. Now we are gonna work on the first Hyper-V VM1. Now that we have activated the Docker machine, um, I've navigated to the directory where the Docker Compose file is present. So if I do a dir or ls, it's gonna give you this. So what I recommend doing is to go back here and then execute this command to be able to build the image. Now this got built very fast. And the reason being, if I look at Docker images, you will see that PictoLearn Dispatcher and Web, which recently got built, were relying on Ubuntu JDK 8 and Tomcat 8 JDK 8. In case you don't have this on this machine, it's gonna pull it. So please bear with it for a few minutes because these are bigger files. And as you can see, one of them is even a gig in, in terms of space required. So please keep that in mind and um, 
you can go ahead and execute the next command to run the container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this off and then I'm going to run the containers. The first thing to note here is once I do docker compose ps, there is one web container, one dispatcher and one MySQL. The second thing to note here is the web does not have a port. And the reason being we actually disable the port here. So the only way to communicate is to use the dispatcher. So let's see how this can work. I'm just going to do docker compose logs hyphen ft and then web. So it is starting up. I'll wait for it to start up. As you can see, this thing started up. So I'm going to go to Postman. First thing to note here in Postman is I'm using the Docker machines IP. And then the port is defined by the dispatcher port, as you can see, 1111. And then I'm using the context path of PictoLearn dispatcher. What I mean by that is if you go into the dispatchers log, you will see the context path is PictoLearn hyphen dispatcher. It says dispatcher here. If I go back to web, and then what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open my SQL client. So and I'm going to start from fresh. Let me close all of this. So what I did was I was able to make a connection into the MySQL running inside that machine. So the way I did that was I connected to 10.0.0.187. If you're wondering where I got this from, if you remember, docker hyphen machine ls basically gave me all the machines running on this machine and we were running the above containers on the first one and the IP address is 10.0.0.187. So I gave it and then if you do docker compose ps, as you can see, MySQL is running on port 8888. So I just gave it a test string, stored the password in the vault and I tested the connection. It says connection is successful. I closed it. I logged into this container here, got into users. I just said select star from users and then clicked OK. There's nothing in the database. So what I'm going to do right now is I just mimicked, uh, as I said in the previous lecture, I just kind of mimicked what we did on use case in the previous use case and I just renamed it to this one. Apart from that, I also made it made sure that it's HTTP. Uh, it's got it's hitting that particular machine on port 1111 with the context path. And obviously, we're going to call the servlet, which is going to do the magic for us. And also the restful URI. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say send. And it says success. And if I introspect the headers, it's going to tell you which machine it actually hit. So in this case, it's 172.19.0.3. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go and check in the MySQL database to make sure there's an entry. As you see, it got inserted. So, uh, so we are sure that whatever we wrote up is working. So now let's go to the scaling part. Now what I'm going to show you is to find out how we got the web host header from here. So what we can do is we can log into the, uh, the root of the bash shell for the web container. And if you see here, it's running on port 172.19.0.5. Okay. And if you log into the dispatcher, so this is where you're getting that information from. All right, so Docker internally manages the IP addresses and this is the way you log into that specific container. All right, so let's go ahead and scale up the apps. So in order to scale up the apps, we first start with Docker Compose PS and then we do Docker Compose scale web equal to three. Now if you do this and then go back to PS, you will see that it spawned two more web containers. Now this can be used for load balancing in case your traffic receives more load. So just know that Docker allows you to scale uh, microservices. It makes it more elastic 
And the reason why we have the dispatcher is to be able to route to one of these. So that said, give it a few minutes until it starts up. And typically for logging from all these containers, we use you know tools like Logly. Uh, there is a tool called Logly or Dynatrace or AppDynamics have performance monitoring tools. If you're running it on AWS, you can also host it on CloudWatch. So give it like two or three minutes until all the containers start up. So basically, I'm just gonna query this. I'm just gonna list all the records in the database. And as you can see, it's 172.19.0.6 right now. And basically, um, the dispatcher is picking up a random IP and just hitting that IP. And then right now it's being load balanced to a certain degree or being routed using a very simple algorithm of picking up the random one. So that's what we did in the dispatcher. So just keep bear that in mind. And as you can see, you can also add users right now. So I added one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm gonna to go to MySQL database, look for all the users. So the total of eight of them. So I'm just gonna query again and go back to the body. So as you can see, you'll see all of these here. Okay, if you need to delete somebody, just click on send and it's a success. So when you list users again, it's gonna have seven of those. So it deleted number one here. So that's basically how you scale up and down. So I just have to show you how to scale down. So if you see there are three containers in web, in case your load decreases, you can just make it one again and it's gonna remove two of those containers. And that's about it. Thank you for taking the course and congratulations for finishing the course. Just before we depart, I wanna go over the Docker cheat sheet. The Docker cheat sheet is gonna give you a list of all basic commands required to use Docker. Open Visual Studio Code, drill down to resources, and here you will find the cheat sheet. The cheat sheet basically gives you all the commands you will require, which, you have which we have covered as a part of this course. So I hope um, you go over this cheat sheet, and then if you have any feedback, please do let me know, and I will continue updating the cheat sheet. Thank you for going over the cheat sheet section. Thank you and congratulations to all of you for finishing this course. If you have any feedback which you think I need to improve on, please shoot an email to docker.pictolearn.com. The email which I'm giving you is not just for the feedback. If you have questions which are unanswered as a part of the discussion board, please feel to reach out to me via email. I will continue sending you course details and information and also updates to the current course. Thank you and enjoy.